How's everyone feeling today? Yeah. Some feeling better, some are feeling pretty rough still. So, um, yeah, we were feeling pretty rough this morning, just yep. a constant niggling from uh, some spirits, which we eventually discussed and dealt with, and they all sort of relaxed their uh, attack. Well, their attack was less effective, shall we say, yeah. after that. Yeah. Um, and it's basically because of this subject that they were attacking us about, because there are many spirits in the spirit world, both males and female spirits in the spirit world, who do not want you to understand the truth about sexual attraction. Because if you understand the truth about sexual attraction, then they have less ability to manipulate you with relationships and therefore less ability to share in the relationship with you or to share in the sexual engagements that, you, that, that happen with you. So the more you understand about sexual attraction, the safer sexually your life becomes, actually, uh, because there are less spirits influencing all of your decisions about relationships. And less injury, really, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. 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 So that's why we wanted to uh, discuss that topic with you today. What we thought we'd do, firstly, though, is just have a bit of a summary first of the soul and how it splits and how it incarnates so that we just remember the basics about the soul and soul attractions. Because actually, sexual attraction is a part of the soulmate relationship and therefore we need to understand, you know, why sexual attraction actually exists as well, both in a pure state and Just in an error-based okay. state as well. You, okay, you want shall me to, we stay yeah. on either side of the board? Yep. Um, is that okay? Okay. So we've discussed with you how God, who has masculine and feminine qualities, created all of these little tiny beings called souls, both of which have masculine and feminine qualities. And depending on the... There's a wide variety of masculine and feminine qualities in the soul. Some, some of the souls are dominantly masculine as an entire soul, and some are dominantly feminine, and, when, and they split. Every soul splits into two in the process of individualization. So we have one half. If we choose a heterosexual... I'll draw it the other way around. If we choose a heterosexual soul... Uh, we have one half and the other half. S they split. And when we say split, one half always leaves the split first and then they come into a body. So let's say it was the male who did that. Then the male is attracted to two bodies that are created for it. There's a spirit body that's created for it and a physical body that's created for it at the time of conception. And the soul then envelops those bodies and remains connected to those bodies for its entire lifetime while it's developing in the, on earth. And then it releases the physical body and then there's a period of time all the way through the spirit world up until the soul union condition, which we'll talk about in a second, that uh, where it, release, it can release its spirit body. So the souls then join back together. And in fact... These bodies are a necessary part of the half of the soul while the soul hasn't joined with its other half. In other words, the soul senses, which are all these feelings that are absorbed from the universe, the se even the sense of sight, taste, touch, and all of those other types of senses, so we're talking not just emotional senses, but feeling-based senses, all of them need the soul, are all funneled, if you like, through a cord into the soul. So there's the cord that joins the physical and spirit body and people call that the silver cord. And, and let's call this, this cord that joins the spirit body with the soul, let's call that a golden cord. Just And through these cords, all of the sensory apparatus of the physical body are a way that the soul then experiences its um, environment while it's half of a soul. Now, of course, the same applies to the, the female when she incarnates. Uh, she's attracted to a female body in this case. Two of them. Spirit body, physical body. Now, we've chosen a soul which has a, 
here in terms of its separation, a soul which has two halves that are relatively equal in its masculine and feminine traits. But if there was a soul that was dominantly masculine and only had a little bit of feminine traits, then they would be attracted to two male bodies. And if there was a soul that was dominantly feminine with very little masculine traits as a complete unit, then when it splits, it would be, it would be attracting two female bodies. So that's the general process of the incarnation process. Is there any questions about that before we proceed further? If, if we can wait for the microphone. Just. AJ, where is the soul before it incarnates? And what does it do? It's in a soul union state. The only time you actually get to see the soul with your, with your soul eyes, if you like, is when you are in a soul union state. So the, only time, the first time we saw a soul in this union, in this state, before it incarnates, was when we, were, when we were in a soul union state ourselves. Because at this time, the soul doesn't actually do anything. It's not aware of itself. It's this process of um, incarnation and into the physical and spirit bodies or gaining the physical and spirit bodies that, um, that help the soul begin this process of individuation and understanding that I am a soul. Before this time, there's no awareness. That we, that we exist in this place. May I ask another question? Yeah. Does it mean as well that the soul in this unconscious condition is not even aware of God? That, that's correct. It's not aware of God in a conscious state. So in other words, it does have a connection with God, mm. and it, but it is not aware of that connection because it's un, in an unconscious state yet. It's yet to actually have a sense of itself and so, therefore, it's yet to have a sense of its universe, the universe in which it lives. So, if you're not conscious of yourself, how can you then be conscious of anything else? And this is the whole process of individualization, which is what this is all creating, is the process of becoming aware of yourself, and then, of course, the process of becoming aware of everything else around you as well. Including God. Including God. Yeah. You can keep uh, going with the questions. That's fine. Yes, please. God created the souls, is yes. that right? Yeah. Yes. So what purpose did he have, if there was any, to make one soul more dominantly masculine or more dominantly feminine, or did this happen by chance, accidentally? Well, no, everything that God creates has a huge variety in it. If you look at, uh, so if you liken it to the creation of trees, you imagine for a moment that every single tree that was created happened to be an apple tree. And there was no other trees. So we would never have any other variety of fruit. We would never have any other variety of like, joy from all these different trees and what they look like. And, and we would actually be very uh, stuck in a very plain sort of a world, wouldn't we? So everything that God does has huge amount of variety and in fact uh, universally almost an infinite amount of variety and it's the same with the soul itself the whole complete soul has an infinite almost infinite variety of potentialities as to whether it be dominantly masculine and dominantly feminine and anywhere in between so the reason why God does this is for our enjoyment so that we so we have more a variety and therefore a wider joy of experience. So it's actually a gift of love that God creates everything with very, very wide variety and not all the same. So you Just imagine if we were all the same, then basically there would never be any um, there would never be any homosexuality on the planet, which would already create a lack of variety amongst you know our experiences here on the planet. So so the the key is is that God is always giving this gift of almost infinite variety to us to experience because each soul even in them uh, when they're split into a uh, say a male form and a female form they each have their unique personality yeah. so it's like a spectrum of personality and attributes if you like of so which the sexual attribute is one is one and and that's something worth pointing out that this sexual attraction this sexuality part of us is a unique i mean it's an attribute of every soul and, and that's why we talk about it under the term the human soul and specifically in relation to soulmates because sexuality was created as part of the soulmate um, relationship yep. of the soul. Yeah. 
I do so understand this. Maybe one last question. Yeah, far away. The soul, when it is incarnating, mm. is completely happy with its own condition, or does not. Yes. Because sometimes when you say you completely happy, it's not even aware of its own condition just before incarnation. Because remember, it doesn't have any self-awareness yet. It gains self-awareness through the process of incarnation. The soul, though, is in a pristine condition without awareness. So, in other words, it doesn't have emotional injuries like the rest, you know, that we gain during the process of incarnation. And to be honest, we only gain those emotional injuries because of the emotional injuries of the environment in which we're incarnating. If the environment was free of emotional injuries, then the soul would go through this beautiful process of becoming self-aware without having to also go through absorbing lots and lots of emotional injuries. Yeah, this was going to be my question because sometimes, for example, if you are um, bipolar or if you are just homosexual, they meet a lot of um, prejudices, a lot of... Uh, um, judgment and then it might not be a very happy situation anymore so that's what why my question well it's only we used not to be all unhappiness on the earth is created by our emotional injuries it's not created by love so god creates all these beautiful things in from a state of love creates all this beautiful variety from a state of love and it's only the environment in which the soul is incarnating that causes it to actually be, be to to attract or, or usually through the parents emotions again attract judgmental conditions so you're right many homosexuals and lesbians in the past have attracted much judgment and a lot of that is to confront us, uh, you know, we need to be confronted in our concepts of what God's variety of creation is. And unfortunately, um, for the majority of people on the planet, we're very resistive to confronting our belief systems. And God is creating variety constantly in order to confront our belief systems, actually, to help us confront the systems of belief that we have. And part of the confrontation of that is the fact that there are some souls that are homosexual and some souls that are lesbian in, in nature. In the sense, um, from God's perspective, it's not really a homosexual or lesbian either. It's not really a label like that, um, which a, we'll it, discuss in yeah. a minute. We'll talk about the soulmate, the pure soulmate attraction in a minute. But uh, the reality is when it does attract the bodies, it does attract two female or two male bodies and therefore we view it here on earth as a homosexual or lesbian relationship. But the reality is every relationship God created is actually a soulmate relationship. So in other words, God doesn't differentiate between a homosexual soulmate relationship, a, le a lesbian soulmate relationship, or a heterosexual soulmate relationship. To God, they are all just one thing, and that is a soulmate relationship. That's all. Uh, the two halves of the soul slowly joining together. So there's no, you know, in the spirit world in particular, there's no labels like that. So, yeah, there's no preference. In our pure state, it's not that I prefer men or I'm attracted to men. In my pure state, I'm attracted to my soulmate. Who now, happens that could to be, be male. A, that, it is a male, but I, I could be what the world would label homosexual. But in my pure state, I would just only have an attraction to my soulmate who happens to be female. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. And we want to talk more about that as an introduction uh, going through this process of what sexual attraction is all about. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? If we come the mic down here and then. Um, it's just a question or just a clarification on going back to the pristine soul. Yes. I'm a bit confused as to whether the pristine soul is in a six-sphere state or a 27-sphere state. Well, you, it, you would that. say that it's in a six-sphere state. Yeah. But it's in, uh, in terms of the first time you can actually view it, it you have to be in a 20-second sphere condition to see yeah. it. The distinction because I the only way to see the soul is in that unified yeah. state. But I understand you're saying because they're in a, in a unified state, yeah. The, yeah. Differential, the differential is, well, there's many, but in the six-sphere state, we're perfected in natural love. Yeah. So the love yes. that God has the, placed in us, the capacity for love that God has placed in us for other people. In the 22nd sphere state, we have recognized, we've fully individuated ourselves, we've recognized God, we've longed to God for love, mm. and we've received that personally. Mm. And we've also dealt with all of the injuries that 
were created through our incarnation mm. that blocked us to our soulmate yeah. and we've reached union in a conscious way. Yeah, so you're totally in aware. This, yes, yeah. you're yeah. not aware yeah. even... These are not conscious of their own uh-huh. union. So yeah. they're not conscious yes. of themselves, they're not conscious that I'm half of a soul. As, as we're all finding out, this is things <laughs> we discover <laughs> after incarnation. Yeah. And um, the only similarity is that they are unified, but that's mm. just because God creates them creates all of us in this unified state. Yeah. So you could say that that is the real self, the complete... Yeah. Yes. Indiv- you know, so the two halves unified mm-hmm. is the complete self. Not mm-hmm. So at the moment, you are just one half yes, of yes. your complete self, but you are one half of your complete self that is slowly gaining awareness, and one of the awarenesses you're gaining is there, it's this awareness that there is the other half sure, out yes. there of yourself yes. somewhere. Right? And that's one of the awarenesses through this process of individualization. That's one of the awarenesses that we eventually gain, that we actually have the other half of us somewhere. Yeah. Okay. Now, for many people who are on the earth, they don't have that awareness. And this is one of the things we, we want to talk about with sexual attraction. But secondly, most spirits don't have that awareness until they reach the fifth sphere or the fifth dimension in the spirit world that's when they begin gaining a much greater awareness that there is the other half of themselves does that make sense so that's generally what happens now on earth we can gain that awareness at a very very early stage if we desire to but the problem is historically is the awareness hasn't been present and so the majority of us don't really understand what's going on with regard to soulmate attraction yep yep if we Put the mic straight back behind you. That's it. And Nico as well had a question at the back when you were done, Anna. Okay. Um, (coughs) If, uh, as I have understood it, um, uh, when your soul is in uh, in union on on the soul plane, if I can use that word, even if you you have reincarnated and now is in spirit and physical body, is that the same with us? No, um, the differ- there is a difference between a person who's reincarnated and a person who is in their first incarnation. In a reincarnated condition, the, there is an attenuation between the connection of the soul and the bodies, the new bodies that have been created. Whereas in the, um, in the original incarnation, so in my and Mary's first incarnation, which was 2,000 years ago, for us, what happened is the same as yourself, and that, it, and that is that in that condition, you are completely connected to your bodies. So, so when you're first at that moment of conception, when the two bodies are created, your soul is completely enveloping those two bodies, and the soul's power is what maintains the bodies and keeps them alive, actually. It, it, that's what keeps the bodies continuing to stay alive. And... And so the, uh, for the first incarnation, you, you don't have an attenuated uh, connection between your soul and your bodies. For, for myself and Mary, the, it's very different. It's the same kind of thing in terms of dealing with emotions, because we still have to deal with emotions. But for us, we're dealing with emotions for a different reason than you are. The, the reason why you're dealing with emotions is because there are injuries inside of you that have been absorbed right from the moment of conception that prevent your soul from growing and therefore prevent your soul from growing in love and present prevent your soul from conceptualizing love and conceptualizing truth and this is so it's a process of learning for the first time for the for the reincarnated soul it's a little different the process is when you when you incarnate, basically what you're doing is your 22nd dimension union soul is now overcloaking t- four bodies, two two more spirit bodies and two more physical bodies, and and the connection of these bodies to this soul initially has to begin in a very very slight way. So in other words, it has to be very very minute connection because the reality is a soul in that condition would kill these bodies due to the imperfection in the bodies that were created through the conception and the absorption of emotions from its parents. And so for us, what we've got to do is we go through a process of remembering our soul and therefore allowing the memories of that soul to flow into us, into the mind of this spirit body in particular. And then along with that, the way that happens is by letting the emotions of each memory be triggered. Does that make sense? 
And so, and it's, so while we still have to do emotional processing in the same manner that you do, the emotions are going to be far more intense than what you do to clear emotion. And on top of that, they are uh, slowly connecting a bigger pipe, if you like, towards the soul until eventually the soul will have complete control of these two new bodies. So we had to start off with very, very little control over those two bodies because it would damage, firstly, the parent who was carrying the child, or, and once the child was born, it would damage the child if the soul attempted a complete connection. And, and we have to re-establish that connection through a process. Now, nobody knew the process before we did it, so we, it, we had to guess about the process, and what we've had to do is find our way through that process, which is very, very different than doing it the first time, in the sense that other people can tell you, this is the process because we've been through it. Does that make sense? But when you're going through the second time, particularly if the, you're the first people going through it, nobody can actually tell you what to do. It's like you're discovering a whole new thing for the very first time. And so you could say that from our perspective, we're going through an experiment. So what you see myself and Mary going through is an experiment. Whereas what you need to go through, you don't need to experiment with that much and it, because you can have other people tell you because they have actually been through exactly the same process, if that makes sense. Yep. So, so the, the reality is, this, like Mary has drawn, this unified soul is now connected to those bodies. Right? But the conduit is very, very weak until this mind in this in this not the brain of the physical body, but the mind of the spirit body, until this mind of the spirit body is able to even conceive that it has this connection and is able to allow the memories of this connection to, tr to, be f to flow to it, which are all emotional, then until then it's going to be totally unaware that it is reincarnated at any point. It's only through this process that it will become aware. Does that make sense? So that's why all of the people who have returned at this point have a, have a period of their life where they're totally unaware. And the reason for that is because we're incarnating into a first fear condition on the planet. And so therefore, there's a lot of denial of the emotions and memories of the soul. And so it's totally unaware. And then slowly, 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 it's got to gain awareness. But that is a choice. It can't you have to make that choice individually. Like, I can't make the choice for Mary, Mary can't make the choice for me. So it's impossible for me to go up to somebody and say to Jane, oh, Jane, you're one of the 14, and for it to actually have any effect on Jane. Because the reality is that unless Jane has the memories, and unless she has the emotions, unless she has the physical experience, the, and allows this emotional experience, so as she's dealing with emotion, unless these memories come to her, and unless she has the physical experiences that are identical to what the 14 have, then you can tell a person they're one of the 14, but it makes no difference. Like, at the end of the day, they're going to have to go through an experience to find it out for themselves. Yeah. Yeah. So, so there is a big difference, if you like, between the two parts. So for the majority of people on the planet, we're still in our first, we're out in our first incarnation, and for the majority of people in the spirit world, they're in their first incarnation. So everything that we're discussing really is primarily based around what happens in the first incarnation with regard to sexual attraction in particular. Yeah. Um, yeah. We, and very similar principles also uh, exist uh, with regard to sexual attraction to a reincarnated soul in the sense that it's still the emotions that are in each half of the soul that dictate the uh, um, a level of sexual attraction. That, and we'll talk about that as we go through, through the From discussion today. From our own today. experience, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Does that make sense? Any other questions you have about that? No? Um, Nico was next, I think. Hello. Um, I would like to ask a question regarding a vision I had. I have the feeling that it, <coughs> it is my memory, let's say, but it contradicts what you have said about it. Yep. Uh, at some point, I, I remember I was, everything was dark, mm -hmm. and I felt the only way to describe it is like it's a, 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 a you know during the summer that you sleep outside and then the the small bedsheet leaves your side 
vulnerable and a breeze flows you and you are a little bit, let's say, cold. And it was at that moment I opened my eyes and I saw the earth from above because I was hovering. Mm -hmm. And then I just closed them again because I didn't know at that time what the whole thing was. Mm -hmm. But I don't understand how I can remember this because I felt that it was before I incarnated. Yes, a lot of people feel that they have memories before they incarnated of the incarnation process. And what that is, is spirits in the spirit world telling you what actually occurred during your own incarnation. So um, there, is, there is a lot of uh, spirits in the spirit world who want to tell people on earth the truth about their own incarnation. And so what they do is they give you a series of pictures and feelings about what the soul felt during the process of the first incarnation. The first incarnation is not uh, traumatic with the exception of when it physically attaches to the physical and spiritual bodies. Before that point, it is not traumatic at all. So in other words, it's, there is no trauma in the soul from the, from the incarnation process. In the second incarnation, there is a lot of trauma in the soul through the incarnation process because the, the soul is going through an experience of contradiction between a love and truth state and no love and truth, and it is totally self-aware that that is occurring. And so it feel, the second incarnation, so my Mary's second incarnation felt v very much different to the first incarnation. The first incarnation we were not conscious of at all, and we had uh, we investigated it through in in the spirit world once we passed. Well, I, for myself, I knew that as I was on Earth in the first century, but uh, but we you can investigate it once you pass as to what the process was only by observing other people go through the process. And so what happens is many spirits observe other people going through the process. They can't see the soul because they're not yet using their soul senses to see. They're still using their spirit body to see. So they can't see the soul, but they can see the effect it has on the energization of the two bodies that have been created. And they can feel where the soul is going, where, it coming, where it's coming from and where it's going through the traces of the energy that the soul emits. And, and so they can see the effects of the soul, not the soul itself, and they see it, actually, they see the process of incarnation through the energy fields that the soul actually admits connecting to the two bodies. And then they can show you a picture of that. If you're a mediumistic person, they can show you a picture of that, and many people on the earth have been shown very complete pictures of that entire process. Many people on earth have then interpreted that as if it was their own acknowledgement of, the, of, the own, of, of their own process. And uh, what I'm suggesting to you is that's not the case. It's just a picture given to you from a spirit of what they have observed in this process in order to um, demonstrate to people on earth the truth about the incarnation process. So, um, so I don't feel that your experience is contradictory to, to what's being said. Okay. It's just a spirit giving you that information. It makes sense because... Yeah. I didn't feel that, that it was a lie. I felt happy afterwards for some reason. Yep. So I didn't have fear. You know, sometimes you have doubt inside you because you know the truth. Yeah. But in this case, it was, this is it. Yeah. The, the second incarnation and the first incarnations are very different to each other. But we want to get back to the sexual, sexual attraction sexual. part of it because we can discuss how the whole, the nuts and bolts of how it all happens as a, sec as a separate issue, but if we can get back to the sexual attraction of it, uh, that would be good. Because in the end, the sexual attraction is very, very similar no matter whether you're, in a, um, you're, you're coming from a reincarnation or you're coming from an incarnation. But like I said, the majority of people on the planet are coming from an incarnation. And so therefore, we, we'll discuss everything from that point of view, if you like. Yeah? Is there any other questions about... Genesis, if we have the microphone. Uh, I think I have little information about uh, the 14. Uh, could you please, uh, what are these 14 you're talking about? And uh, 
Uh, are they uh, were they aware of themselves before uh, you told them that they were under the, on the, of the fourteen, or you, they were? Well, firstly, for the majority of the fourteen, I've never told them anything. So I've never told them that they were, they were a person who's reincarnated or not. They've had to go through the process of exper experiencing that themselves. And the only reason why I told Mary was because she asked. Um, but even the telling of a person is totally immaterial, really, because at the end of the day, the person has to go through their own experience. So Mary, if Mary wasn't one of the 14, I just said to Mary, you're one of the 14, she couldn't manufacture all of the emotions and all of the memories of uh, our experience together. Um, so, so it's impossible for her to actually accept she is one without going through a process herself that's totally independent of myself. And that applies to all of the 14. Do you, do you know, but are you asking who are the four, what, what is the, who yes, is the, what is that the that When I refer to the 14, yeah. they are the first seven soul pairs that ever chose to reincarnate from the, from the spirit world onto this earth. I'm not saying that there aren't other reincarnations occurring onto other planetary systems that are in, in the universe, but on this particular earth, there has only ever been, well, they, they were the first seven. There have been others since, I feel, but they are the first seven to have gone through this experience for a purpose. And the purpose is to teach these kind of principles to mankind and help mankind understand the entire process of the soul, including the you know, understanding and receiving divine love. Now, um, some of the majority of those are not self-aware. Some of them are aware, but in very, very strong denial. So, so when I say the majority, it's probably the other way around. The majority of them are aware of who they are, but they're in very strong denial of their emotions. So they've gone through a period of realising who they are, but then as soon, as soon as they did that, they started getting very frightened, and as a result of their fear, they now turn off the entire process of, of connecting to their soul. Um, and while they do that, there is nothing that can be done really to assist them, aside from just reminding them to connect to God and connect to their emotions. Uh, but the majority of them, of course, uh, don't wish to do that at this point. There are only four who are wishing to do that in a, in a more um, aware state uh, at the moment. Four uh, other than you two? No. No, so four including us two. All right. Mm. Yeah. 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 And, and I was someone who went into a lot of denial about it when, when I first met AJ, and I didn't want to believe it, and I tried many other hypotheses to try and discount yeah. what, I was, what I was experiencing. Mary's first mission was basically to try to convince me that I was wrong. Because so this is really cool, but <laughs> don't be Jesus, because that's really scary. That yeah. was my, that was my basic premise. So, yeah. so yeah. the majority of emotions Mary first had was no, that is all incorrect, and what you're talking about is wrong, and you're not Jesus anyway. No, what you're teaching's <laughs> right. What you're teaching's what, right, yeah, but yeah. but you're not Jesus anyway, yeah. and I'm going to convince you that you're not. Yeah, that was the general feeling she had. Ha have you got in touch with those uh, the, the the other ten? Uh, uh, yes, through the law of attraction, I have actually physically met. Uh, 13 of those 14, uh, so you know, so the seven 12. pairs. So I've personally met 13 of them. One of them's now passed, um, but so there's one that I have not met. So that's only 12, babe, because you're of the 14th. Oh, yeah, sorry, yeah. yeah. <laughs> of course I've met myself, but uh, yeah. Um, yeah, so yes, uh, so I've met thir thir 12 of the others, but there's one that I have not met uh, at this point, yeah. And I don't believe I'm going to meet um, soon either, uh, that one person. Uh, why? Uh, because the, the location on the earth where that person lives, I'm aware of where she lives. And I also, the, uh, the different degrees of separation between myself and herself at this point in time. Uh, because of the location in which she lives. Um, when I say the degrees of separation, do you understand what I mean? Like, you know, I know you, you know somebody else, you know somebody else, and, and, and you know, actually for every person on the earth, there's a, they, they, they suggest there's around six degrees of separation, basically, where you know someone who knows someone who knows someone six times, and eventually, you, you, there, you know, there's a correlation there between the two people, even though they don't know each other. Now, in my case with this particular person, the one person I have not met, I can feel the number of degrees of separation between the people who know her and the people who know theirs, those people and so forth, 
back into the people who know myself or have heard of myself and at the moment I can feel that it, that it, that is almost six degrees of separation between the two of us whereas for all of the others there is no degree of separation at this point and and I can't explain the reason why that's the case it's just the way it's working and I, I feel strongly that it's to do with the soulmate I have met the soulmate of the person um, but the soulmate doesn't want to activate his soulmate longing at all He's totally closed down to uh, doing any emotional work. He's aware of who he is. Uh, he's, his name's John the Baptist from the first century. He's aware of who he is, but he has no desire to do with any emotions. He has no desire to accept any truths. He has no desire to, uh, at this point, connect with myself and Mary and, and talk with us about the process. He, he has no desire to do any of those things. And in particular, he has no desire to connect to his soulmate. So at the moment, he is quite separate from his soulmate and that's causing the, the difficulty for us to connect to her. Uh, he has a female soulmate. Yeah. Does that make sense? Is that it, Dionysus? That was the... Sure. Sorry. Um, do you know what happened to the one who has passed? I mean, if he was in the first period again down... You know, uh, when any of the 14 pass, they will automatically go to the condition that their soul attra uh, has attracted due to their condition that they're on earth. And in John's case, it was the Apostle John who passed. He, he arrived in the first dimension of the spirit world, in the first sphere. He had to work through emotions, which he worked through quite rapidly because he started remembering his spirit life from the first time quite rapidly. And uh, some of his children from the first century came to speak with him and so forth. And there was a lot of memories that came up as a result. So within a period of three months, he, he was totally aware of who he was. He wasn't in denial anymore about who he was. And then within a period of three years, he's now in the 17th or 18th uh, dimensional spaces. Denise, if you think about, you know how we were talking about how the soul still is in the 22nd sphere and there's this attenuated connection. The only thing that happens when one of the 14 passes is the physical body has gone and the spirit body still has to regain that connection. So it's still the same emotional process. But it's a faster yeah. process because they're now meeting the same people that they remember. Does that make sense? So yeah, it's like so you're almost forced into it in the spirit world because there's all these memory... Uh, with all your memories, and this applies to whether you're in your first incarnation or not, all of your memories are locked away inside of you until there's a point of contact, until there's a point of trigger, a trigger point that actually allows the memory to flow. So even with your own childhood memories, many of your own childhood memories at the moment are completely suppressed and, and they will remain suppressed until such a time as you have a connection point between the emotions you're denying that hold those memories or, or that are about those memories and the memories themselves. Once there is a complete openness between the emotion and the memory, then the memory will flow in its complete detail. So some of you will go for a period of time in your life where you don't remember you know, what you did when you were four years of age, for example, and then all of a sudden something will trigger you and now you remember because, that, because there's a connection point. And it's exactly the same for all of the people who have reincarnated. They have to go through these series of connection points through their experience to actually... and then allow the emotions to be present before they will remember. And many of the 14 uh, who were the first 14 to reincarnate have a deep resistance to do, doing that process. It's a deep resistance to remembering anything about what or who they were. And as a result of that, they are resisting their memories quite strongly. Now, in some cases, they are accepting their memories, but uh, as the, like John the Baptist is, accepts many of his memories, but he's not processing the emotions. He's not working his way through the issues of love and truth and he's not allowing the memories to change his life. And so nothing can happen until that allowance occurs. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Okay, so that's a summary of the soul's incarnation. Now, what does that have to do with sex, is the question. All right. So what we need to do is focus now on what this particular incarnation process, how and what effect that has on sexuality, on sexual attraction. Okay, so here we have the two halves of the soul. And let's look at a heterosexual couple. They are, remember, they've got in their bodies now, so we'll just draw their bodies as a little side point because really the bodies are just a little side point to the soul. The soul envelopes, envelops sorry, and covers 
those bodies. In other words, the soul provides the energy for those bodies to exist. And, um, and a lot of the connection... And as soon as the... When a person passes, the soul is no longer connected with one of those bodies and therefore the body cannot exist. It's quite, quite simple. And from that moment on, it will continue... It will decay eventually until it decays to nothing as does everything that it doesn't have energy on God's universe it decays to another form of energy it always occurs like that so here we have the two halves with their bodies oh, there's, the guy's got his hands up in the air there Ray. Hooray. Hooray. <laughs> we're incarnated <laughs> a ray sex is that what it is so 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 the two halves are incarnated right so now and let's say they're now beginning this process of growing. In other words, they're developing, they're absorbing things from the universe and therefore absorbing things from their experience. So they're starting to feel things from other people, in other words, in particular from other people. But they have other experiences going on as well and they start developing emotionally as well. And they start growing. And uh, during this period of growth, they, uh, they, the first few years of growth, there isn't very much of a focus on connection with the other half of themselves because they're still discovering themselves. So therefore, there's very little connection with the other half of yourself um, with the exception of energy flowing between the two halves of the soul. Um, in other words, if I'm only two years of age, I have a very uh, slightly developed intellect in comparison to when I'm eight years of age I have a very slightly developed awareness of myself when I'm two in compared to when I'm seven and and in comparison to when I'm 20 so so in that very slight condition of personal awareness when I'm two years of age it's very very hard for me then to become aware in a even with an intellectual concept of some kind that I have another half and and be aware of where that other half is is there any questions about the state of growing, Ant Anton? Could you I just go, yeah. sorry, grab some water? Sure. He wanted to know, is the, um, the soul aware of the other half, even though the two bodies might not be? Yes, the soul is aware of the other half. And this is the interesting thing, is that because, because of the multi-generational injuries on the planet, there is very, very little awareness of, a soul, of soulmates on the planet. So the average person who is born onto this planet, who is incarnated onto this planet, firstly conceived and then born, absorbs the belief systems very, very rapidly of its parents. And almost all parents on the planet have the belief system that, you know, you can connect to anybody. You know, there's, there's lots of people you could, you know, you could spend the rest of your life with. It's just a choice. And so this belief system influences the intellect of the spirit body's mind of the child and so, therefore, it feels quite unknowing in terms of, very, from a very young age, unknowing of a potential connection between itself and its other half. It's However, really, it's not unknowing, it's blocked. It's I mean, blocked. It's already blocked. It's to blocked that, yeah. to the connection through the emotional uh, impact of the parents. But the souls themselves can still have information, the two halves still have information flowing between them. And, uh, and, and often that will remain for the entire of their life, no matter how much we're denying it in our mind. So, so there, are, there is this thing that can happen all through your life, actually, where you have this really strange feeling sometimes that something's happening to someone else and you don't even know that other person, let alone know what's happening to them, but it's something not very nice. <laughs> you know, in other words, there's, there's this connection with some... some uh, f and feelings of... Um, what, what do you call it? John, the Apostle John would call it discombobulation. <laughs> feelings, feelings of... Uh, an unsettled feeling. An unsettled feeling inside of, the, inside of yourself. Uh, not understanding any reason why you feel so unsettled or anything like that, but the reality is that often it's the other half of yourself that's quite unsettled or going through some pain or suffering, and one half, your, your half is feeling that. So yes, there is an energy flow of information uh, uh, and emotions and feelings to in the other half, to other half of the soul and that will always be the case however the more intellectually shut down we become our soul becomes like a dried out prune so if you could think about it 
as I'm shutting down myself, shutting down my desires, shutting down my passions, shutting down love, this is something that happens throughout our life generally, what happens is this soul, instead of looking the nice pristine, let's say that's the soul shape for an example, now it's looking like this, you know, like this withered up prune, you know, like that's what it looks like, very little energy coming out of it and because there's very little energy coming out of it to anything, there is also very little energy coming out of it to its other half. So its other half may be in a pristine condition, right? but, but this half would not feel very much of the other half in that condition. Does that make sense? To the spirit who we've asked the question? Yeah, the spirit, um, he actually passed and on earth he actually had tendencies towards both sexes, but he right. was confused sexually himself. So yep. he wanted to know about himself as to um, when he passed, he became aware that he was just a male and not who he believed he was a female. So right. he's really confused. Right. So there is a lot of sexual confusion, not only on earth, but also in the spirit world. And we'd want to discuss why that is the case as a part of this discussion yeah. today. Yeah. And yep. he wanted to know about the differences in the quality of love between the soul when they're incarnated to the quality of love that you guys have. Yep. Is it just quantity of love that you receive? Um, or is it that your soul grows in a way that... Well, no, because the, um, in the, uh, before you can reincarnate, you've got to go through a union. To go through the union, you've got to receive quite a lot of divine love, which is very, very different to natural love. So, so the reality is that there will be different qualities. So he will see in our, in our spirit body, for instance, it does look quite different. Even though he can see the injuries in my bodies he here, and he can see the injury across my chest here, and a bit on this shoulder and a bit around my throat so he can see those injuries but he can also see behind that and see that the actual chakras of the spirit body are different to the person like yourself even though we might be in exactly the same condition of brightness in terms of our bodies you can see that there are actual different things that are different in each body because of the, and it's very different from a reincarnated when a spirit looks at a reincarnated person they see a very different person than a than a person who's in their first incarnation. Yeah, I think he was confused in terms of the, um, God's love. Does it have attributes to it? So yes. that he's so confused about uh, yes. God the love quality has of the love that he hasn't received and that's giving him the confusion. So that's right. he hasn't received that aspect. God's love, when you receive it, changes or you could say enhances many of the attributes of the soul. The natural personality of the soul is enhanced but uh, also it changes the condition of the spirit body quite markedly. So what he observes with his spirit body eyes will be very, very different between a person who's incarnated and a person in their first incarnation and a person who's reincarnated. So if he has a look at this audience here, can he see that there is a person on, in the audience with a very similar spirit body to myself and Mary, even though it's not quite as bright? Um, uh, most, That's so what he's attracted to. So that's why he's trying to work out why he doesn't have... Right, so he can see that there's one other person in that state and he's trying to understand why. And that's just the difference between the spirit body of the person who is incarnated for the first time and the spirit body of the person who's reincarnated are very different uh, spirit bodies in terms of how they look to another spirit. Yep. Um, can... Yeah. Sorry. No, go ahead. No, he's looking forward to the rest of the discussion. Yeah, that's what yeah. I was going to yeah. say. Yeah. I we'll, think he's... It. As we proceed with the discussion, we will answer many of the questions of why did these attractions happen on Earth? What's driving attraction on Earth? Why do many people on Earth feel they're attracted to males and females? What is it about bisexuality? Why, you know, why do, do many people feel that there is such a thing as bisexuality when obviously if we're talking about soulmate attraction here... Obviously, there's only one attraction, not two. So why do ma many people were attracted to both genders and so forth? So we can answer all of those questions as we proceed. Also, when we pass into the spirit world, um, we still have the same groups of emotional injuries that drove sexual attraction on earth. And for that reason, many pe pe spirits who pass into the spirit world in the first to the third dimensions, so into the third to the first, third spheres, they still believe they have attractions in a certain direction and many times they only discover that they don't once they hit the fourth and fifth dimensional spaces in the spirit world with condition of love. And many of them before then don't really understand why those attractions exist and what we want to do today is explain why those attractions exist. Dennis, you had a question? 
Yeah, d d the withered prune of a soul. Yeah. Does, does, that explains why we have so much resistance to actually getting into our emotions in the first place? Yes. Um, unfortunately, when in our first incarnation in particular, because our soul is, is fully connected to the bodies, we are very much going to absorb the environmental conditions that the soul has incarnated into. And as a result of this absorption, which happens very, very rapidly, um, we learn to shut down emotional pathways in our soul quite rapidly. We also shut down um, due to the belief systems and getting feelings of approval from parents and so forth. We shut down many of the truths that our soul could be aware of quite rapidly as it gains self-awareness. But unfortunately, even the discovery of those truths get shut down as well. And so we finish up in the process of incarnation sort of being born even in a withered state from a soul perspective and and then of course that withered state grows usually it's very rare for the withered state to actually you know re be released it actually usually grows as we shrinks. you know experience yeah the withered state grows in other words our soul shrinks as our growth in, in the physical continues because our environment projects more and more and more and more at us that we are still trying to maintain and, and eventually we get into addictions, we start closing down desires and in, in particular the most difficult soul to help have an awareness in the spirit world is the soul that has no desires. In other words it went through life like in a very um, laissez-faire you know like sort of way in a sense that it went through life not really make choices not really making decisions letting other people dictate to itself its life and when that kind of a person passes in the spirit world they often have very very little bit of soul energy it's sometimes better on earth to exercise your soul in a actively uh, negative way or an actively positive way in other words to either be hot or cold but not to be lukewarm because it's the people who are lukewarm that often in the spirit world take the longest to actually open up and change. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. So that withered state is a very hard state to even determine any truth about yourself, let alone the truth about your sexual attractions. Mm. Yep. Yep. Uh, it would be great, I reckon, if we talked about how God created this system uh, in a pure way yep. right because we're going to talk a lot about the injuries but it gets really heavy <laughs> if we if we don't see the the beautiful picture that God actually created and yeah. I feel we're already going so let's yeah. do that yeah yeah so how does soul attraction work sexual attraction work from God's perspective perhaps well in reality from God's perspective there really isn't such a thing as sexual attraction in the sense that you can be attracted to a, any person of the opposite gender. The reality is, from God's perspective, that there is, this, the, there is only this thing that attracts the two halves of the soul. In other words, what you would call the soulmate attraction, right? So if we call that soul attraction, in its pure state, the only person that you would ever be sexually attracted to all of your life would be the other half of yourself. So in other words, your soulmate. You would never actually feel a feeling of sexual attraction to any other person. So you could have like 100 women all lined up naked, but your soulmate lined up in those naked women. And if you're a male and you have a heterosexual attraction, if you're in a pure state, None of those naked women would ever, would ever cause you to have any sexual feelings whatsoever. But as soon as you were opposite your soulmate, immediately you'd have an erection. Does that make sense? That's how it would be. It would be just exact, it would be pure, right to the point that it wouldn't matter what condition those other women were in, how beautiful they were physically, whatever, you know, how attractive they were or anything like that would not make any difference to your sexual response. Because your sexual response would be only dependent upon your soulmate response. So in other words, you could only ever have a sexual attraction to the other half of yourself, no other person. That's what God created to be in a pure state. So in that state, we could all live naked on the planet, couldn't we? and never have any response to anybody else 
sexually except to the other half of ourselves, right? which is in fact the way God created it to be on the planet. Does that make sense? Yeah. And babe, how did, how did God create this? So God created us to incarnate and individuate, but God has designed certain uh, things that cause the attraction between the, other, the, the halves of the soul? Yeah. Can you yeah. talk about that a bit? There are three primary things that we need to focus on with the attraction between the two halves of the soul. And, and these primary things you've already know about, actually. <laughs> so that, that, that's a blessing, right? You, you already know them. The first primary thing that causes a, a huge sexual attraction between the two halves of the soul is truth. When only even one half of these two halves get into a condition where they begin facing their truth, and I'm not talking about intellectual truth here, I'm talking about actually feeling the truth about things, all of a sudden, the other half, no matter what its condition is, will be sexually attracted to that half. Right? And when I say sexually attracted, it will feel a draw and a desire to be with the person who's in the condition of truth. Right? So this condition is, say, if it's the masculine half of the soul, it's a condition of truth about what is my true soul condition right now? What is it I'm really feeling? What is my personality? What is my personality? What is my desires? Yeah. And it would know the truth of all those things. And it, the more it knows the truth of all those things, the much stronger pressure, you could say, or attraction, attraction yep. there is on its mate. No matter what its mate's condition, it will be drawn. And it, won't, it might not even like many of the things that it sees, but it will still be drawn. It can't help itself, basically, to be drawn to the other half through this aspect of truth. And that's what happened with us. <laughs> Does that make sense? AJ was in a large, um, you know, uh, he was fully like living in the truth of his identity, of uh, his passions and desires, he was living in his desires, he was facing a lot of emotional truth constantly about himself and I felt compelled towards this man but I also felt like, no I don't like this about him and I really don't like this and I don't want this kind of life and I really, but I couldn't stay away. Yeah. So even there are times when Mary left and went away and even during those times, her life became more tumultuous yeah. because she could feel, like, I have to go back. I have this, just this feeling of drawing back. And that happens through truth. So if I stayed in a condition of error, not facing my own identity, not facing my personality, who I am, what, are my, what I desire, what I long for, and I shut down all of those things, now Mary's part of the soul cannot feel any of that. And unless Mary's part of the soul enabled all of those things, I wouldn't have ever been drawn to her and therefore we would never find each other as a result. In a sense. So truth is a major part of the soul opening to its other half. Without truth, you cannot open to your other half. Now, if you think about it, this relates a lot, doesn't it, to a normal relationship. A normal relationship, we cover truth over quite frequently you know I don't want to say that because I'll hurt them I don't want to say that because they'll be angry with me I don't want to say that because they'll feel bad about themselves and so forth and so forth and so forth so we have a whole lot of un unwritten rules a whole list of them of unwritten rules that we make so that we don't tell the truth to each other now what I'm suggesting is if you're still very attracted to your partner but you don't tell them the truth then it can only be codependent addictions that are attracting you to each other, not a soulmate attraction. Now, by the way, two halves of the soul can live in codependent addiction with each other without actually knowing that they're soulmates. So it's possible to live together in that state as soulmates, um, not knowing that you're soulmates even, until you deal with the codependent addictions. But it's truth that actually shatters all codependent addictions. So it's truth that actually destroys all sympathetic attractions, which we'll talk about in a minute. We'll talk about the sympathetic attractions of the soul. Second thing, desire. How can the other half of you feel you when you are shutting down you? <laughs> Does that make sense? 
if you're shutting down your desires and passions, in other words, your real self, how is it ever going to be possible that the other half of, the real, of your real self will ever discover you, no matter what their condition is? Impossible. So what we need to do is we need to learn to connect to desire. And I'm not just talking about sexual desire here. I'm talking about all forms of desire. So we do need to connect to our sexual desire, but we also need to connect to all other forms of desire and passion. In other words, all the desires and passions that are a part of your personality, you need to allow yourself to personally discover and connect to and embrace passionately. When you embrace those things passionately, the other half of your soul will fill you. When you try to shut those things down and you don't embrace them passionately, the other half of your soul will not be able to fill you. Can everyone see that? Okay. You want to mention the third? No, you go for it. The third, obviously, is love. So when we talk about love, we're not talking about codependent sympathetic addictions or expectations and demands. You see, in many relationships today, what we see happening is I might have a, a, a demand coming out of me. Please cook my dinner. That's my demand. Right? The woman who's willing to cook my dinner, I feel loves me. The woman who's not willing to cook my dinner, I feel doesn't love me. Does that make sense? Just that one demand, I will basically base it upon that demand being met as to whether she loves me or not. Now, is love dependent on whether the person cooks my dinner or not? Obviously not, but it's amazing how many times we feel that. You, you be in a relationship and come home after a hard day's work and find the other person spent the whole day by the pool and hasn't cooked your dinner and see what you feel. Right? Many of us feel very upset in that place, right? Because we do have a feeling inside of our soul that love would mean that she would have cooked my dinner for me, right? That's just one thing. Now, love is not the same as demand. So it's not demands, right? It's not expectations. And is not um, addictions. So I'll just put not those things, right? Now, unfortunately for many relationships today, the whole relationship is based upon those things. I will meet your demands as long as you meet my demands. I will meet your addictions as long as you meet my addictions. I will meet your expectations as long as you meet my expectations. I will have a feelings transmitted to you that I love you as long as you make me feel safe and secure and supported and so forth. But as soon as you make me feel unsafe and insecure and unsupported, I then feel you don't love me. So in other words, our definitions of what love is will drive the attraction. Now, if the soul half, one soul half, is in a more pure state of love, in other words, they don't have demands, they don't have expectations, they don't have addictions with the opposite gender, the opposite gender will be more attracted, the and in particular, the soulmate half will be more attracted to them as a result. Does that make sense to everyone? Sorry. Yes. You wanted to? I just wanted to talk about, you finished about. Yeah, I think yeah. so. Um, about what. Does everyone have any questions about that before yeah. we proceed? I don't want to go ahead. Yeah, so go ahead. Sorry? Just say that again. Um, <laughs> Can you use a microphone? Yes, of course. Thank you. If, if the soul doesn't have expectations of the other one... There's some reason we're not... Are we getting the sound? We're not. There's something wrong with that mic, so... If we can get the other mic over. You shouldn't have to turn the mics on or off ever. They're always on and Igor just adjusts the volume. Yeah. So... If, we, if Igor can just check that mic for us, that'd be good. So I think uh, it works. Uh, yeah, I can so hear. I think I heard you say that if there is no expectation coming from the one person, the other half's love or attraction will be stronger. Yes, as long as the other is not in codependent addictions too. You follow me? 
Because yeah. if the other have a codependent addiction, then of course there would still be a block. So, so in other words, if, I know, if Mary no longer, as she's worked through her emotions, and she no longer has a feeling that to be a good woman, she has to cook a meal for a man. Let's say she's worked through that and she doesn't feel that anymore. And I still feel like a good woman will always cook me a meal when I come home from work. Now, Mary's worked through her blockage about it. In other words, she no longer believes the man that she has to do that for the man. But me still having the expectation is going to affect our joining, isn't it? Because I'm going to then believe she doesn't love me. And if I believe she doesn't love me, then I probably won't want to be with her. So, but perhaps, and perhaps this is, um, this is what I wanted to get to. These three factors, the more the soul de develop, the more the half of the soul develops in these three things the more there is, if we maybe don't use the word attraction because it, we, we um, associate the word attraction with this feeling of desire, yeah, I want you, but it's more like a magnetism, if you like. There's a drawing together of the soul halves and that's part of God's process to confront the error in the other half of the soul. Now, Does, can everyone see what Mary's saying because it's really important. Yeah. I think it's important to see that what Mary's saying is that there is an attraction the soul, the two halves of the soul will be attracted to each other, not necessarily sexually at this point, because we. But, but if they were in truth, desire, and love, and in, in in perfect in that, they would also be attracted sexually, of course. So what you know it depends whether we're comparing a perfect thing where we've released all of our emotion, or now what we're doing is talking about the imperfect thing. Now, what I'm saying is if we're perfectly in truth, perfectly in desire, perfectly in love, in other words, at that point, you would probably be at one with God, right? Then at that point, the soul, other, soul, uh, other half of your soul will be drawn to you, not necessarily sexually attracted at this point to you, but will be magnetically, as Mary used the term, drawn to you. Yeah. So, and perhaps I just wanted to talk about what God has created in the soulmate relationship because it, it is this, it's, remember you're, the other half of your soul is the other half of you. So, you're very matched in terms of your passions and desires, your loves, your creativity, what you, you know, what you would most like to do with, with this individuation that you've been given. And when you come together without injury, there's like... Uh, well, as as we teach, that eventually there's a complete merging back into one to one soul. But before then, there's this beautiful experience of the sharing of love energy, if you, for want of a better word, a part of which is unique and sexual for that person. And but so, the, the, but the sexual is only a part. It, it's a part of this beautiful connection that can exist, and it's like a, a flow of um, emotion, of energy between the two, the two halves. Mm. Yeah. Um, and so in other words, if Mary activates her desires strongly, I will actually not only feel that more strongly attracted to her just generally, in other words, I'll be attracted to the fact that she now has these desires because if I'm activating my desires, I can feel, oh, her desires and my desires are pretty much identical. To each other, and that then is, of okay. course, going to cause a attraction. But on top of that, it also, if I'm clear emotionally, will open up different parts of my body and cause me to feel a sexual, a stronger sexual attraction to Mary as well. And we'll talk about the relationship between these other attractions and sexual attraction as we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And and just what it feels like to me, you know, when you're talking about the demands, expectations, and addictions. Very often, even if the couple are two halves of the one soul. It feels to me like we create, it's almost like the facade self. There's like these, this, um, there's this murky division between us where we're just wanting you make me feel good about this injury, I'll make you feel good about that one. And we have this kind of, it's not even a connection between the souls. It's a connection to help us avoid our it's souls. It's a connection between the fake selves. Yeah. Not yeah. the real self. Yeah. Remember, the soul is the real self God created, and the fake selves are the so selves we create in order to avoid the pain of what our parents created, which is a long way separate from what God created. 
Yeah. Soul attraction, so, uh, the, the true attraction between soulmate halves is based on what God created is inside of these souls, the personality and nature of these souls. Yeah. And so even the, the most fantastic relationship we've ever, we feel we're in or we've ever had right now, is it's really like in comparison to this beautiful connection and sharing, openness, joy, sexual union, this flow between two, two individuals. It, this this thing that we think is the best thing we've ever had doesn't compare it at all to the beauty that that comes from this open space of feeling your true perfect mate really mm. yeah can we also illustrate can you see physically how um, when you are two let's say you're a couple that are not soulmate a couple and you're drawn together and you're in this binding even if you're in perfect condition of love so both even if you were both in at love. one with God in harmony with truth desire and love and I suggest to you if you were doing those things you probably still wouldn't be in the relationship but let's say you were still in a relationship with the person sexually and I, I feel personally that that's impossible um, and I haven't ever ever seen anybody in the last 2,000 years of my existence in that state but if that could be the case each half of the soul would have completely different desires they would be, have completely different personality because they are belonging to a different couple altogether, a different, their, their soulmate is somebody else. And as a result of that, to, to stay in the relationship, they'd have to overlook the fact that we have completely different desires and we have completely different passions and we have a completely different measure of truth inside of us. Like every soul, even in its pristine state, has a completely different aspects of its personality. And as a result of that, there's an automatic gradual separation of the couple as they grow towards God if they are not soulmates. There's going to be an automatic separation of the couple. Now in the first century I was asked the question, a woman had seven partners while she was on earth, she was married seven times, which one of those men would she stay with then if she was in the spirit world was the question that I was asked. And I said, none of them potentially because she would become like the angels in the spirit world. And what I meant was she would become only attracted to her soulmate, wherever that, whoever that might be, and whoever that might be might not be any of those seven men. And therefore she would be with none of them. That's what I meant in that discussion. So, so the reality is, unless we engage these things inside of ourselves, how can we ever... Um, attract the other half of ourself. Very, very difficult to attract the other half of ourselves. But the beautiful thing is that as we do, it will happen naturally. Automatically. Yeah. It will happen automatically. God, God created this process so that you would find your soulmate. As long as you engage these things, you're yeah. going to find them. Yeah. Yeah. And the reality, as we've mentioned earlier, there is energy flowing between the two soul halves even in an unconscious state. So the reality is your soul and your own mate are aware of each other at some level. The key is for you now to become you know, in, aware in your mind as well as in what's going on between you emotionally. And this is, something, this is something that is going to require these things to be activated in you. Now this is the reason why most people never find their soulmates until they enter the fifth sphere of the spirit world. Because by the time they've entered the fifth sphere, in the third sphere they've learnt the lessons of truth, Generally, in the fourth sphere, they've learnt the lessons of desire right, completely. They're in their desires and passions by this stage. And they're obviously received a lot of love at this point from God if they're progressing on the divine love path, but they're obviously in a lot of love if they're on the natural love path. And because of those three things being activated, they usually draw their soulmate to them by the time they enter the fifth sphere of the spirit world. Now, on earth, we don't have to wait that long. We can attract our soulmate at any point in time in our pro progress, but of course we do need to address these issues in a pure way before we're going to actually know who our soulmate is, even. Yeah? Now it's interesting because every soul has a signature of itself. When I say a signature, I'm talking about all of these aspects that make up your characteristics and personality. You could say that every single soul has, in, has its own individual characteristics and personality and attributes. 
And this is why when you get to a condition where you're open emotionally to feeling these things, you can go up to a person and go, wow, that person feels very much like that person over there. And, you know, you start seeing the linkage between... No, and so for myself and Mary, we often meet people who are often in different relationships or, or not in relationships at all. And we go, yeah, those two are soulmates, but we don't tell them. We just let them work through the emotions that they need to work through before they'll become aware of it themselves. And because you can actually feel the character or nature of each person's soul once you become open emotionally to doing that. And you can feel the differences in the character and nature of each person's soul. And so when, when two people feel identical in their nature, even though they may be in a different form physically, like so one might be in a fa male body and another one in a female body, you go, whoa, these are probably soulmates, right? You can, feel, you can feel the signature, if you like, of their soul. Is there any questions about that so far? Oh, Diana? I had a question, yeah. Okay, oh, this way. I just wanted to ask a question about truth. Yep. Well, you said that um, when one half of the soul faces the truth about itself, now did you, is, does that mean, um, or the injuries, the addictions, um, wh what exactly Not just the injuries that? and addictions. Also, it's pure personality. So in other words, the, the half of the soul needs to come to allow itself to discover itself. So this is where desires and passions are a big part of that as well. In terms of what is the truth of my nature? What, what kind of things do I really enjoy compared to what my parents told me I should enjoy, for example? What kind of things do I really love compared to what my parents told me I should love? Uh, what kind of things do I really have a passion for compared to what my environment tells me I should have a, compassion, a passion for? Yeah. So naturally, in that process, you're actually facing your addictions, your injuries, all that stuff. That yeah. has that's a yeah. yeah. So the rea oh. the reality is, when you when you face these truths inside of yourself, you automatically face the addictions. Yeah, mm -hmm. automatically. And because of that, you now are in this space, and because you're in that space, through your own soul, it, it, you've, your your own soul is now feeling itself. And because it's feeling itself, remember I said earlier, if you can't feel yourself, how can another person feel you easily? Particularly if the other person shut down towards themselves too. Well, it's very difficult. But if you can now feel yourself and you activate yourself and you feel and stay in your passions and desires, what effect does that have on everyone around you? Everyone around you, oh, they feel like they, can know, they know you better, that they can feel you they can feel these things coming out of you. So therefore, there's a feeling of recognition that they have of you, you know, and, and they can feel your passions and desires. Now, that applies very much so to your soulmate, of course. So your soulmate, feeling you is a powerful thing. So if you're not feeling you, then how can your soulmate feel you easily? It's pretty hard. Yeah, it's pretty hard to, mm -hmm. for, the, for the soulmate to do that. So, so, so far what we've done, we've talked about the actual process of incarnation and then what we've talked about is how, how joining or, or attraction occurs between the two halves of the soul if they're in a state of perfection. And also we've talked about how the truth, desires and love are the things to activate within yourself, whether you're in error or not. They are the things to activate within yourself if you want to draw your soulmate to you, right? But we've yet to discuss sexual attraction. <laughs> Can you see? We've discussed these principles, but we've yet to discuss sexual attraction. So what we need to do is we need to now put sexual attraction together with these other principles. All right? So we were going to talk about sexy feelings and chakra openings. Yes. Yep. Yep. So you want to draw the female over yep. there, and I'll draw the male here. We'll draw them basically the same size if we can. <laughs> <laughs> Mary's always being different, right? <laughs> okay, so now many of us are aware in our first incarnation in particular that we have seven primary chakra points. Now, what the chakras mean is that there are energy systems, aren't they, of our body? Our body has all this energy flowing through it and where the crossover of energy occurs is 
they're called our chakras. I think they are points of 192 points of crossover are the major chakra points. So the major chakra points, if we just draw them in, the base chakra, then there's the yeah. second chakra, there's the third chakra, there's the heart, our fourth chakra, our throat, our fifth chakra, our third eye chakra, our sixth chakra, and then our crown chakra, seventh chakra. And each person has those. You actually have them, if they're operating perfectly, they're like a funnel of energy coming in and flowing out of your body, and they rotate in a clockwise direction. And um, they also come out the back of your body. So the, the, the back of your body and your front of your body, if you could think of it like. So if you're looking at my third chakra, there'd be like a funnel of energy coming out of both the back and the front of my body, like that. Right? Now, the back is more to do with intentions. In other words, what you're going to do in the future or what you feel you want to do in the future in terms of your future life. And what coming out the front is your current state or your current condition. In other words, what you are involved in right now. Do you, do you see the difference? One is your future intentions or your feelings of intention about a certain thing and the other is the actual feelings you have right now about that particular thing. For that reason, you can have a chakra uh, in a different state coming in at the same chakra, the, the third chakra, in a different state at the back compared to the front. So you could have that one open and that one closed. You could have that one op operating in the reverse direction and this one operating in the right direction. You can have all sorts of things happening as a result of the two states. But let's simplify it and just look at the front in terms of our current state because it's our current state that that generates or determines most of what happens in terms of attractions between the two people. So right. can we talk about what it's like if we were not injured, yeah. emotionally injured? What would happen sexually? So you want to start with that or you want me to? No. Mary's keeping me on ball, you see, <laughs> today. That's what I've asked her to do. Um, all right, so, so what would happen in a non-injured state is that every one of these chakras would be completely open and working perfectly, and I would have no sexual feelings whatsoever for any single person other than my soulmate. So, yeah. So, how does that happen on a chakra level, babe? Like, how does that? Well, for example, if I can explain how it happens, it, it's a really important point. Yeah. So, imagine these chakras are like conduits of energy. They're like vert vortexes entering the body. Does that make sense? Or leaving the body. So you've got all these vortexes going into the body, if you like. If I draw them like that, like vortex in the body. Now, if I know myself completely and I know uh, my desires and passions in particular, but in particular I know who I am, I know I have a sense of who I am and everything, then that means my second chakra will be operating perfectly. Right? There will be no problems with it at all. And it's not just a simple matter, by the way, of having the chakra rotating in the right direction. There are 192 points of energy crossing this chakra, and every one of those points of energy would be operating in the right direction right, for that to occur. So that's how that chakra is going to be very, very open. So if I know myself completely... Now, if I come across and I see a woman there who doesn't know herself completely, uh -huh. could I be attracted to her? And the, the answer is quite is easily no. I can't actually even be attracted to her. I can love her in the sense of care for her and that's the state she's in and have compassion for her, but I can't actually feel a, an attraction for her. So you wouldn't feel any sexual attraction at all? I wouldn't feel all? any sexual attraction for her okay. as a result. You need to talk in the microphone. But if she was your soulmate? If she was your soulmate, you would still not feel a strong sexual attraction for her 
but you would know she's your soulmate because you already have worked out who you are. Does that make sense? And therefore, it's easy for you to recognize the other half of yourself. So you might not feel drawn to her, you're not drawn to her injury. In other words, you're no longer feeling sexual feelings because of her having injuries, but you'll actually feel her real condition because you know yourself and you're recognizing yourself in the other half of you. Does that make sense? So do you think it's true? Because you're sexually attracted to me, babe, I know. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I certainly have a lot of injury in this area. Yeah. Would you say that our sexual uh, union or matching would not be complete or in full intensity until I work through those injuries? Definitely cannot be. But you would still have an attraction for Well, me. Let, let me talk about how attraction actually works. Yeah. It doesn't actually work by the other person's emotion. It works when the other person's emotion affects yours in such a way that there's a connection of energy flow and then energy flows through you through yourself and it's your own energy you're actually feeling that's sexual in nature not the other person's do you understand you need to explain that a bit more um, how can I explain this in a way that's easy to understand do you want to use an injured example then because if we use an injured example it's sometimes easier to explain like for example let's say let's say I, instead of being completely open with this chakra, in other words, everything being right with that chakra, I have a feeling of neediness directed out of me towards a woman. Right? The feeling is in my childhood that I'm probably denying is an emotion that my mother re never really cared about me, never loved me, hu hugged me, never really felt love from her. I always felt like my mother d didn't like men and so therefore I feel like she doesn't like me. And instead of being angry with my mother about that, I decided that the best way to handle that emotionally is to try hard to get her approval all the time. In other words, I'm now needy for the woman's attention and approval. So that's coming out of me. That's I've drawn a different colour to show that it's not healed, but there's a feeling coming out of me here where I haven't healed this area of myself and I have a needy feeling going towards the woman. Now let's say the woman is very similar to my mother in that she has very similar emotions coming out of her that my mother had. In other words, she was ang she's angry with men, she feels like what she wants to dominate a man and she wants a needy man to control. That's what she wants. So now, I, myself and her, will be able to have a flow of energy flowing through this second chakra. Agreed? Now, because it's now flowing, this energy is now flowing, even though it's flowing because of an error, I will now feel a sexual attraction for this person. Because the energy between the two of us is flowing, and, and as a result, my own energy is flowing through me. You see, every time there's a part of your body that's blocked, in, from an emotional or energetic point of view, the flow of your own energy does not occur, right? But as soon as we engage a person with, an, with a sympathetic injury, the flow of energy through yourself will occur, which will have the effect of opening up the first two chakras, which are basically the sexually motivated chakras of our body. Does that make sense? And now that this is open... These two are open because of the flow of energy that I've got happening out of this. This is in error and this is in error, but it causes a flow between. It's now causing a flow in me. So now I'm feeling sexual arousal due to the flowing of energy between myself and this other person. Do you see? I'm now feeling my own sexual arousal. The other person may not even be aware of it, right? but I will feel it. It's very likely, though, that if these injuries are very complementary, we'd think this is the best love affair ever and we definitely soulmates and we can't stop, we can't get out of bed, you know, because if our injuries are so complementary, it causes a huge... The flow of energy that's been, like, blocked up and uh, problematic for ages is open and we feel this huge flow of sexual energy that we think is desire 
for the other person. For the other person. Now, the reality is if only one of these points open, we will already feel a level of sexual attraction. Right? And the person can be 90 years old and I can be 20 and I'll feel it. Right? It doesn't matter about age or anything else. It doesn't matter how they look. They can look pretty or ugly. It doesn't matter. I'll still feel it. Right? There will still be this feeling that's generated and therefore... That, that will affect how I feel and that will then motivate my choices and decisions. Now, imagine if there were two of these out of harmony with each other, but in sympathetic attraction. And the flow of energy between those two now occurring. So, for example, if uh, as a woman I have lots of sexual shame, I feel icky because something happened in my childhood and I, and I feel my sexuality is dirty and I'm yuck. And here's a man who feels like what would be the sympathetic injury? He feels like he's, he, he's not, he doesn't have any sexual shame. He feels like he can do anything sexually and it doesn't bother him at all. In other words, he's quite shameful how he uses his sexuality. The woman would then feel very comfortable with him. He's because not he's going not to shame her. Yeah. Yep, do you understand? Exactly. Yep. So now we've got two chakras totally open with the <laughs> feelings flowing through ourselves, feelings flowing from the top to the base flowing through ourselves, how strong is our sexual desire going to be now for that person? Much stronger, you see. Now imagine if there were three or four, which is highly irregular, by the way, on the planet to have that many totally open in an injury state to each other. But imagine if there was three or four. It would be such an overwhelming feeling, wouldn't it? That we'd say it's not just sexual attraction, it's love. Yeah. It's love and it, uh, she's my soulmate or he's my soulmate or whatever. Like if I'm a woman who doesn't, who doesn't want to speak up because I'm afraid of men and I'm afraid of being uh, shamed or humiliated and I attract a man who's very willing to speak up in every situation and take care of all of those things. And who feels that a woman needs to be kept quiet anyway. Yep. <laughs> right? <laughs> then I'll be happy. Another attraction. Yep. Right? Can you see... The more of the injury attractions I have, the more of the injuries that I have that are sympathetic with the other person, the stronger the feeling is, the stronger the bond is. Right? And that's the problem with sexual attraction on the planet. That's the problem. We're often in codependent sympathetic injuries and the injuries are so intense that we're denying them, both parties are denying them, that when we do feel an attraction, we're not going, wow, well, what injury is causing this attraction? We're going, wow, this is a pure, in, it's a pure relationship. Now, on top of that, let's say on our, on our sixth chakra um, that we have a large degree of connection with a group of spirits. In other words, I'm a male in this case and I have a huge group of male spirits with me who are sexually dominant and in fact many of them might have even raped when they were on earth or been sexually, you know, really abusive while they were on earth sexually. So let's say now I've got a connection with them. How would I generate a connection with them? I might be afraid of them, for example. Or I may feel like I am actually feel powerless without them. So in other words, I want the power they give me, the feeling of power and control they give me. Now imagine that. Now we've got spirits who can share in this flow of sexual energy passing through me when these things open. So what are those spirits going to want to do? They are going to want to find a woman with a codependency and also sympathetic uh, addictions that will open me up by being with her so they can now share in my experience, my sexual experience. Now... I not only have the complexity of dealing with my own unhealed emotions, but now I'm actually supporting the unhealed emotions of a group of spirits with me who are now looking at the women and going, uh, no, no, there's one, uh, no, no, there's one. And, and they're pointing out to this man, and he's, he's drawn to look at them. He's, they're pointing out to this man the women who he could get into bed with. Right? Through their codependent addiction-based injuries. So now we have a group of spirits influencing and sharing on, sharing from, like vampires, sharing on the sexual feelings that are passing through this man 
and they are now setting up his love life for him. They are now actually pointing out the women and he's drawn to those particular women as a result. They're pointing out the women with whom he feels an attraction and the reason why is they wish to share in this flow of energy that's flowing through him. Or there might be women spirits with her wishing to share in the flowing of energy flowing through or even male spirits with her wanting to share the flow of energy through her and so they cause her to feel like, yeah, he's the man. He's the person that I want to be with. Can you see now it's getting quite complex in terms of attraction? This is where sexual attraction now has become so muddy that how do we even know what's going on? How do we know whether it's our own attraction or another person's attraction? And this is where much confusion results. Where we have women spirits with us, men spirits with us. Usually most people have both genders with them due to the different injuries involved. Now some of those women spirits, like if I had a group of men spirits with me who, who were attracted to men or women spirits with me who were attracted to men and my energy is going to flow even greater when a man is on the other end of this even though my man's not my soul mate the the openness and the emotions involved and the spirit influence involved will cause me to feel an attraction to the male automatically so i can even be confused about what gender my soul is actually attracted to in that state and therefore we have a lot of sexual attraction confusion and therefore uh, many people feel like they're bisexual as a result because uh, they have both sets of injuries like for example as a male I might be very very angry with my father and very considerate of my mother right? and then if I have a group of women with me who feel that I should feel that way considerate of mum and angry with dad those women may also then want to hook up sexually with another male and they can, through the opening of these injuries and sexual feelings flowing through me, cause me to desire a male connection when in reality I am a heterosexual male. So there's lots of confusion that can result through these, these injuries occurring between the two halves. Katerina, can we have a microphone there? So would you say that the parent's projection is less of a pull on this one or is it more the spirit influence that makes you do that? Like, Because I grew up, everybody wanted me to be a boy and so I thought, you know, males are better and then or like I would be attracted to women in the sense I would think women are more beautiful than men. And well, everything is based upon the emotional injuries you absorbed from your parents. Remember, this spirit attraction is based upon an emotional injury as well. So the, emotion, the spirit attraction is an effect of the underlying cause. And the underlying cause is the unhealed emotion that exists within the different... The, remember, the emotions cause the crossing of the energy flows in your body. So if you understand that it's the emotion that causes the chakras to even operate in any direction, then you understand that each particular emotion can have an effect on the operation of the energy that flows in and out of your body and also flows through your own body. Now remember I'm saying to you that the sexual attraction is an emotion, is a feeling that flows through your body and it is activated by what flows in and out of your body. Right? So interesting that he's come... Give you a hug right at that point. So another thing you don't want to know about there, Katerina. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> but it makes sense because I understand now like the feelings that I had that were not mine altogether because yeah, it, it didn't make sense. Yeah. Can I point then. out to you what happened in this interaction with your son? Sexual, sexual attraction is still an issue that you feel much shame surrounding. And every time a person talks about sexual attraction, you remember some of your past, which you feel ashamed about. Now, the feeling is you don't want to feel that shame. So you want to know the information without feeling the shame. And then Peter always comes to mummy's rescue. Whenever Peter feels like mummy wants to avoid an emotion, you know, she needs me now, she needs me now. And he comes rushing up as a result. Does that make sense? So the key for you is to, yes, it's good to ask these questions, but also to notice how your own shame affects the question even, like in terms of what's going on. Yeah. 
Thank you. The, what was the other statement you wanted to make? Was there any? No? Excellent. Okay. Any other questions surrounding this? Even this? Um, well, I've he felt a lot of uh, resistance actually to asking. I was, yeah, something's going on. But uh, what happens if you start healing some part of this? Mm -hmm. Because I've been with my partner for 29 years. Mm -hmm. And now I don't have any sexual desire whatsoever. Mm -hmm. But still there is kind of a, a, a bond flowing. Yeah. Yeah. And... Uh, can, yeah. I, can I point out the two main impediments to desire? What are they? So the main impediments to desire, so if we're looking at what will affect desire, what are the main reasons why a person wouldn't feel desire? There's two main reasons. Can you think of any? Can you think of them? Just any desire, even. Any desire for anything. Yeah. Fear, Fear is the primary thing. Is the primary one, and anger is another. And of course, there's another that's probably fairly dominant as well, which is shame. Shame, which which is the result of judgment, if you like. Right? Yep. Now, those things in particular affect desire right so if if you don't feel sexual desire then something's going on with one of these three things does that make sense or all three of them or all three of them yes yep. now um, in particular when it comes to healing emotions revolving the other gender or in terms of attractions what we need to do is we need to be particularly focused upon the feelings we have with the other gender. So if you're with a male and that's your partnership at the moment, then what you need to do is look at your fears with a male, your anger with the male and your shame. Now, when I say fear, anger and shame with the male, I'm also saying in regards to yourself as a female with the male. Yeah. So, so in other words, you may have lots of shame that is sexual in relationship to the male that it may be dictating why you've closed down things sexually. Now, the key is firstly to start with the anger generally because the reality is that shame and fear are emotions that we usually cover over with anger. So in other words, we use anger as a way of suppressing shame and fear feelings. And what we need to do often is start with the anger and then we will be able to get into the fear and shame related issues. Now, many people, are, after a period of time in their life, shut down sexual desire. And they say to us that, oh, we've been, we're in a lovely relationship, but we don't have a sexual desire. And, and my answer to that is, well, you're not in a lovely relationship, number one. Because a lovely relationship will include sexual desire. Now, many men understand that, right, because they're less shut down to sexuality many times than women because, because of multi-generational reasons. Many women are more shut down to sexuality to, than men because of multi-generational reasons. For example, many women have been harmed by men sexually. So therefore, there is a lot of anger and fear, fear and shame, and shame yeah. associated with the opposite gender uh, regarding sexuality and so that causes them to shut down towards the opposite gender. Many women have been treated uh, objectified, shall we say. Most men are not objectified by sex. In other words, when, when a man's self-definition in the world we currently live in is often more about what he accomplishes than his sexual life. But many women are objectified by sex. They just are projected out from men uh, that they are sexual objects. That causes many women to feel a great deal of anger towards men as a result because the male is not accepting her other attributes but rather only accepting one part of herself, just her sexual self. And even then, they don't really care the personality of the sexual self. They're only caring about the vagina and the breasts and the bottom and so forth. You know, they're only really connected to the physical of it. And for, because of that, many women have lots of anger about that in comparison to men. Most men, you know, not as angry about those particular things. So culturally and environmentally, there is a lot more pressure on women and has been multi-generationally 
a lot more pressure on women to shut down their sexual desires than there is towards than there is by men. For that reason, many men don't feel as injured sexually. They have often perpetrated injuries sexually, and therefore they have many emotions to deal with as a result, but they don't feel as injured with their sexuality as women do. And for that reason, in a relationship, many women close down sexually before the man does. And I'm not saying that's all the, always the case, because nowadays uh, there is a lot more problems with impotent, impotence in men as well. And that is the direct result of anger in the male towards the female. So, so there is these growing issues and problems in sexual relationships due to these three primary emotions being held on to. Does yeah. that help? you with the question yes. can you feel why you didn't want to ask the question <clears throat> first i felt a lot of fear about asking it yeah and i felt also a lot of impatience that uh, we never came to a point where it would be appropriate actually to ask it right and i wanted to be very personal to be uh, to be about myself yeah. and my partner if he would like that yeah. um so it was a lot about um I didn't want to um, take up the space here. Yeah. Kind of not being important enough or being wrong for some reason. Yeah, see, I suggest actually that the real reason, Eva, is that uh, there are women spirits with you who do not want you to heal your sexual, your sexual desire. I actually guessed about that, but I'm not so... <laughs> Aware of spirits. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, and this is happening with many women at the moment. Um, there are many, many spirits in the spirit world, women spirits in the spirit world, who are enraged by the entire concept of the soulmate union. In other words, they feel the soulmate union is definitely not where women want to go. They believe that women, they want women to be have power over men because they have had years and years, you know many thousands of years of being dominated by men now they wish the women on the planet they see a growing movement on the planet where women can now dominate men and so what they try to do they try to influence the women to use sex as a tool for control and uh, and so many women are doing this now and causing women uh, cause the women in the spirit world i mean are doing this now causing women on the earth to either be afraid angry or ashamed and stay in those emotions rather than healing those emotions towards the opposite gender. Or I would say be in rebellion of those emotions. Be in so rebellion of those emotions. Either shut down sexually completely yeah. Yeah. or reclaim sexuality but in a very angry way that objectifies men. So I see this growing trend amongst women of my generation to be quite uh, promiscuous and... Overtly sexual. They become uh, like men, in fact. They've become like, like the, the men of male. the past. Yeah. yeah. And apparently shameless. <laughs> but I feel it's a, it's a rebellion against these core feelings that most women carry around sexuality. And they call it reclaiming your sluttiness. <laughs> Basically, that's what many women are, uh, have in, in the younger generation are now involved in as well. So you can go into rebellion, which is not what you're doing. You're really going into the, the shutdown place. Yes, and I that, think it's There's a lot of anger fear. in that. It's anger. No, there's always anger in being shut down. Okay. Always anger. Remember I said start with the anger. Fear and shame are the underlying emotions, but start with the anger. The anger is always the start because whenever we shut down, can you feel, whenever you shut down, it's, imagine for a moment you and I were standing the opposite sides of a door and you got the door and closed it on me. That's what you're doing sexually. That's anger. That's anger, yeah. you see? Yeah. Why would you want to get the door and close it on the person? Does that make sense? This is what's happening between yourself and Pierre. To so protect myself. To protect yourself. There's other reasons too. There's a lot of reasons. But can you see they all have to have an angry effect. So the causes might be fear and shame. But, but the angry effect the action is, is the angry. action or the choice to reject the connection. And therefore... The anger is where you need to start. And see, ma many, many of us don't want to own the anger, and so we deny it exists and so forth, and we want to focus on our fear and shame. But the actual act of closing the door on another person, what, in whatever circumstance, is actually an angry act. 
So the reality is there must be anger present. Does that make sense? Yes. So what would the way be? I mean, is it to uh, get into a sexual situation and then kind of get in touch with my anger and Certainly, that get is out one, of it? That is one way, certainly. Um, to allow yourself to be touched sexually and then to feel your resistance to that. And then not just to feel it but express it like so you know if you if if your partner touches you sexually and then you feel like really annoyed by it then let yourself instead of feel just feeling you know really express your annoyance and you'll not be not to your partner obviously well, well you know obviously he's going to be present because he's just touched you but but if you express your annoyance just in terms of letting the emotion flow what will come out of your mouth will often be a complete reflection of that anger. So in other words, you'll be surprised sometimes what comes out of your mouth, right? Um, I've been often surprised what comes out of mine when, when, you know, when I've felt something between myself and Mary and then I go into this emotion, I feel that, and off I go and then wham, you know, there it is. That's the emotion. I can feel that now, you know, just by saying the words that are coming out of me while I'm feeling the feeling of anger in this case. So, so you could engage it that way. Or you could just notice what annoys you on a day-to-day -day basis with regard to men. So, so you know, if, he, if he's never cooked a meal, does that annoy you? Because it's whatever annoyances are there that actually cover over the reason why you've closed the door. Does that make sense? And so a lot of times we overlook our annoyances in a relationship. Quite frequently, in fact, we do so. Where, for example, Mary might have cooked my meals for me for 10 years. And in that whole time, the only time I've ever cooked a meal for her was when I took her out to dinner somewhere else where somebody else cooked. <laughs> right? Let's say that's what happened. So 10 years she's had of this now. Can you feel that if she really felt herself emotionally, she'd be going, wow, he really expects me to do this. He really wants me to you know, provide, you know, cook the meal for him all the time. Many men don't even know how to cook, let's face it, like because of this emotion, particularly, you know, in different cultures. And, and she then feeling a build-up of resentment that occurs over years. Naturally so, wouldn't it be? Because I'm not, you know, being loving and I'm not even noticing that I'm being unloving. Uh, that naturally then would cause this resentment to build up over years. Now, as the resentment builds up, that's anger, the sexual desire will automatically shut down. Has to. You, you can't have desire when there's anger present. Right? So, does that make sense either? So look at those annoyances with men in particular. It's the annoyances with men and the beliefs about yourself that will cause your anger to be, become present. So when I say the beliefs about yourself, they are the areas to look at like... You know, do you feel that your body's getting older now and therefore you're not as attractive anymore? Do you feel like, you know, um, you know, you might have had, like in many women, they've had a few children and uh, the doctors have had to cut their vagina and, and don't do things to get some of those children out. And they now have a scar with a cesarean as well and so forth. And they don't feel as attractive and therefore they don't feel like, you know, they really feel like the man would find them attractive either. And so forth. So look at the areas of you know what the man is doing and your frustrations and annoyances, and then look at also how you perceive yourself. What what are the beliefs you have about yourself sexually, in particular? Mm. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Um, I, I feel actually a, a pressure in my throat uh, now. Yep. <laughs> So Anna, facing this, uh, asking, asking my question. And so can, can we just stop you for a second then? Yes. Just, if you feel, Anna, like, is it an embarrassment type of feeling that's closing down your throat? Or is it, is it what kind of feeling is it that's, that you feel? It's, it's more sort of something... Uh, uh, Externally uh, constricting you. Yes, sort of not, not um, voicing yeah. myself. Yes. And uh, I have had uh, um, um, uh, 
coming and going uh, ability to listen to what you have s said as is a ooh. Yeah, that, that is spirit influence causing I you to yes. shut down. Yeah. And this as well is the same. I guess so. And I'm saying, what I'm saying, the reason why I bring it to your attention is because these are women around you who do not want you to heal things from a sexual perspective. Now, because of that, they, you are going to struggle to heal while this connection remains in place. So the first thing to look at is if, if spirits are around you, so here's the spirits with you, there are women spirits with you, affecting you. Now, if they're affecting here and affecting your um, consciousness, if you like, allowing you to go in and out of being present, then the first thing to look at is what hooks do you have into other women? What, what are the feelings you have with other women? Because there's something going on here that allows these women then to affect your body. And you're allowing the open pathway between them and you, energetically, that causes them to be able to affect this area of your body. Does that make sense? So the key is to look at what is my hook into them? What do you think it might be? What's your hook into these women? What, what are your hooks into women on earth? Have you noticed much about that? What, what's your feelings with women on earth? Uh, that, uh, uh, competition and envy is coming to me. Competition and envy? Yes, yeah. okay. that was, was, drop, was dropping down to me. So competition and envy, what, what do you feel about yourself when you're envious of another? What do you feel about yourself when you're competitive with another? woman I'm talking about. So what do you feel inside of yourself? When, when I'm envious of another woman, I feel um, huge, fat and ugly. So she's slimmer, prettier and huge, fat and ugly. Uh, s slim, pretty and... Uh, slimmer, pretty. What's the opposite to... Smaller. Smaller. Smaller, yeah. tiny. Right, so yeah. smaller, yes. Yep. Elf-like and then I'm more like a gorilla-like. So you feel you're taller than she is, so therefore not as feminine. Feel like wider than she is, therefore not as feminine. And I and, uh, can't remember the third one again. But let, Slimmer. let's... Slimmer. Obviously... Ugly. 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 ugly, ugly, that's right. So she f you feel she's more beautiful than you are and therefore more attractive. Now, when you... So can you see that you're avoiding those three emotions of I'm not pretty enough... I'm not pretty enough, and, and so forth. It's an Australian song. It's an Australian song. You might not know me, and uh, um, that you're avoiding the fact that you're bigger, and you're and so you, you. There is grief inside of you about those particular things, right? Now, um, if you feel that, um, what kind of woman, women spirits, do you feel would be with you, if helping you avoid those emotions? Can you see that those women spirits must also have very similar emotions yeah. to you? And to me. Yes, to you. Like in, a, in other words, they are avoiding the fact that they're not pretty and they're trying to connect to you saying, no, no, don't go there, don't go there. You know, you're right. You're right. You, there's nothing wrong with you. You're pretty enough. And they are, you should feel bad towards those other women. That's in other words, we feel like that and you, you're right to feel like that. Yeah, you know. those women are up themselves and they're arrogant and they're, you know, you know they, they feel all of those emotions towards the other m women through you, so therefore they have very similar experience, right? Now, why would those kind of women want to close you down here, do you think, from speaking? Have you any idea of why they would want to close you down? See, what do they get to do when you feel bad about yourself and they're trying to make you feel better about yourself. What, what do they get to do? <laughs> now I'm actually not understanding any, any longer. I, I, I'm, I'm a bit overwhelmed with the words and I feel that I know that I, 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 I do understand things, but right now I don't. Okay, and I suggest to you that these women are just not wanting you to even engage this uh, logical discussion that we're having with you. Because it's actually very logical what's happening <coughs> with you Emo emotionally. What, what is happening is that they wish to continue to project envy, jealousy and so forth through you to other women on the, on the earth in order for themselves to feel better about themselves. 
And if you heal this particular issue emotionally, where you feel pretty, you know, attractive and, you know, not, not huge or anything like that anymore, if you heal that emotionally, then they will no longer have this ability with you to project those emotions through you. Does that make sense? And so therefore, they would prefer that you don't heal these things emotionally. They would prefer that you avoid them completely. So are those uh, spirits also part of me not meeting a partner? Yes, I believe so, yes. Because the main reason why you're not attracting a partner, I, I would say the spirits are an effect of the reason why you're not meeting a partner. Because the main reason why you're not attracting a partner is because you don't feel good enough to attract a partner. Does that make sense? You feel huge, unfeminine, fat, and Unattract unattract ugly. unattractive, right? That's the feelings you have that you're avoiding. While you avoid those feelings, then the, the, your partner has already got a job he's got to do <laughs> to be attracted to you, can you see? He's going to have to make you feel the opposite to every one of those feelings. Right? And that's a huge projection then that a potential partner, that he's got to make you feel good about yourself, he's got to make you feel like you're attractive. Even if he feels you're not attractive, he's got to make you feel like you're attractive. Even if he feels, no, there are flaws that Anna has, he's got to say, no, Anna has no flaws. You know, even, if he, even if he feels that, yeah, Anna could do with losing a bit of weight, he's got to say, no, no, Anna is fine as she is. He's got to say, he's got to have these, he's not allowed to tell the truth to you. What he's got to do is he's got to tell you what you want to hear at the moment because you don't want to feel those particular emotions at the moment. Does that make sense? And that is a big emotional demand on a man and most men get very tired of those kind of demands very rapidly. Yeah. Because uh, the last couple of days uh, what I have come in contact with is that I have an addiction, a need to, to feel special. Uh, and uh, uh, my mother and my father have, have put me on a pedestal. They still do. Yes. So I, I'm sort of, I am gorgeous. But yeah. of course I, I know you I'm not. You don't feel it. No, yeah. because I don't want to, to sit up there on the pedestal. Yeah. Uh, so I, I realize that this is, this is something I need to have from both, I guess, men and, and, and women. Uh, I am special. Yes. And uh, the last thing I, I got was that I also feel that about um, the partner or my friends or everyone I sort of choose that that person needs to be special too. Yes. Yeah. And that also a to make me feel more special. To, to make me more special. Yeah. yeah. It's a bit like uh, you know, if you have an emotional injury that you that you're not worldly enough, then you want a partner who's more worldly than you are in order to feel like you're now because you've attracted this partner more worldly as well. You know, we often do these kind of things. And these kind of emotions are the emotions that cause much sexual attraction on the planet, but are not based on real the real soul-based attraction, sexual attraction that we're talking about, that we can have. Yeah, yeah. Now, we never got to your question. Was that part of your question? <laughs> That's true. Um, I, I have, uh, si it, since my teens, I have had this strong, really strong longing to meet, as I, I said it then, my life, my life partner. Mm -hmm. That was the word I used then when I was in my teens. Yep. And uh, a life partner to, to create together with. Um, yeah. So now I'm sort of a little bit back to what I was hinging at when I asked uh, at Katarina's. Um, my ca Can I oh. <laughs> word the question for you? If you've had such a longing for a life partner, then why have you not met him? And this is, this is why you're looking at the potential answer of, oh, he must have died. All right? And uh, I suggest to you that there's other reasons why you have not met him. And, uh, and in fact, one of the reasons is about this longing for the life partner. You remember, if you, if you for, for example, get a book and write down a list of all the things I expect from my life partner, and put that as the heading of the page, and then write down all those things that you expect from him. Yes. Right? 
in the end, you'll probably find you'll fill up that page and you'll probably be able to go over even a few other pages and have a long list of different expectations that you have. Now, can you see that every expectation is what we said uh, uh, ages ago now in this discussion, that they are about addictions? Now, remember we said if we're in addictions, we're not going to attract our life partner. So we can in here feel like, I wanted my whole life partner my whole life. Why haven't I met her or him? The reality is, no, you haven't wanted your life partner your whole life. What you've wanted is your definition of what the ideal partner is. That's what you've wanted. And that definition of what the ideal partner is, is actually your definition of how they're going to meet all of your unhealed emotions and they're going to meet all of your addictions and expectations. That's the reality. And there is, so the reality is, we haven't really longed for our soulmate in that place. What we've longed for is a man, or in your case a man, who matches the description of those pages and pages of expectations. That's what we were looking for. Now, the poor man comes along, and let's say he only matches 10%. Of those addictions. Then he's not special. That's not he special. He doesn't even it? get a look. He in doesn't even get a look like, in oh, now. Who are you? He yeah. might be your soulmate, but you can't feel he's your soulmate because you've got a list of expectations. Now, I put to many of you that actually your list of expectations, which are all driven a lot by what happened when you're growing up, but, and we'll talk more in detail about this after the break, what happened when you're growing up. And I put to you that all of these expectations, all come from unhealed emotions and unhealed expectations from our childhood, but are often, if you think about it, exactly what our dad is, or, or the opposite of what our dad is, depending on whether we liked our dad or not. And this is exactly what our mum is, or the opposite of what our mum is, depending on whether we liked our mum or not. And as a result, we're not really seeking our soulmate, we're really seeking our daddy or our mummy, but just a younger version that we can have sex with. Now, it sounds pretty bad, doesn't it, when I put it that way, but the reality is that's really what, what is going on. And the reality is, unless we heal those expectations that we have about, you know, what if, what if the man came along and he was five foot three, and how tall are you, Anna? I don't know in... in, in what, the, what's in centimetres? One, uh, one and 76. 176, right? So you're about five foot nine and a half. And he's five foot three, so he's now six inches or so, so, you know, t shorter than you. And uh, he doesn't seem like he can protect you very well. You're bigger than he is. Right? So that, that, that emotional addiction is going to go out the window, isn't it? To have a protector for your life and so forth. And, and this is the problem we face, is that, is that we often have so, we're so blinkered in terms of our expectations of our and let's, let's write it down, our ideal partner, not partner, um, that's really what we're looking for. And that is not the same as soulmate. Well, the truth is... No, 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 I, in terms of... In ter these are, I'm referring to the injury-based ideal, right? The reality is our soulmate, from God's perspective, is our perfect ideal partner, but it doesn't, he or she does not necessarily meet the list of ideals we have. So what, that's why I suggest to every single person, one great exercise with regard to sexual attraction is to write down all of what you believe is ideal. I, I did this, uh, I took uh, quite a few pages to do that myself. <laughs> And I even, what I even did was I found pictures of women on the internet, you know, like with the ideal face and the ideal <laughs> everything. I, and I, I, I put them in a folder on my computer and I looked at it every day and I'm going, yeah, why, does I feel, why do I feel like that's the ideal, you know? Like, let, let yourself really experiment with it, you know? Like, find out why you feel yeah. these ideals are ideal. And in all of the cases revolving around myself, I found I was either avoiding sadness, avoiding grief, avoiding loneliness, avoiding my soulmate grief, and, and a lot of other emotions, actually. And in the end, what, what I realised that I was, in many cases, doing what, what I'm just suggesting that just before, and that is I was looking for somebody who was like my mother 
in a younger version. That's all I was doing. Right? And there is a lot of reasons why we do that. Um, because, you know, they are the emotional injuries we have. They came from that person, so that's what we're looking for. I identified with my mother, not so much my father, with regard to what's the ideal. And so, therefore... So the ideal for me at that time was that uh, the woman had to be about five foot three inches tall. Mary is about five foot six or seven, seven. inches tall. Yeah. So Mary's not my ideal. Under those circumstances, Mary's not my ideal. I was looking for a shorter woman... And Mary's taller. Now, once I worked through the emotion, I then realised, hang on a sec, my soulmate could be six foot. What am I going to feel about that? Right? And, you know, then I was open. Like, if I, if I was only open to the woman being a certain height, this is where these um, internet dating services are difficult, right? Because what you have in the internet dating service, and by the way, I tried that too. To find my soulmate. But, but what happens in the internet dating service is they go like, you know, preferred height, preferred size, preferred this, preferred that, preferred, you know, and all these preferences. Now, what I suggest to you is that you need to investigate these preferences. Investigate them and see them for what they are. They are addictions usually, stuff that got created during our childhood about what our, preferen uh, our preferences are, usually addictions that were created in our childhood. And so we need to see them for what they are. To be open to our soulmate, we need to be open to all the possibilities. And I'm very, very glad I became open to all the possibilities. Right? Because without that, you, you can't attract the person, or you might attract the person and not even recognise that they just... You know, you sit down with them, talk with them for a couple of hours and go away and think, yeah, that was a nice discussion, but, you know, that's not my ideal. And straight away you've, you've just dismissed your soulmate, your, ide your ideal from God's perspective. Yeah. Shall we have a... Yeah, break can here? I just address... Who feels drowsy and non-engaged? Like... Yeah. No. Right, yeah. Yeah, drowsy. Can yeah. you just put up your hands again? It's okay. Quite a few of the women I'm noticing. Quite a few of the women. I'm feeling. Are doing this. I'm feeling yeah. the the cloud descend. Like there's a lot of people disengaging further and further. And yeah. I'm like I'm primed to talk about shame and spirits and. But we're not going to get to talk about that if you're already disengaging yeah, about the good things. It's like <laughs> oh no, that window's closing now, um, because I feel like everyone's sort of like oh, yeah. Yeah, so... The, can I suggest to you, these are women spirits wanting you to remain single or remain in control. Yeah. That's yep. all, they, all they're doing. They're wanting you to remain single, remain in control of your life. When you enter your soulmate relationship, you will not desire control of your life. <laughs> you won't desire your soulmate to control your life either. You won't even think about control. Yeah, ironically, you'd be most in control but you won't have this need to desire, need, need, to, need control. to control, rather. Yeah. yeah. Does yeah. that make sense to everyone? Yeah. Yeah. You won't have a need to control. You won't have a need to be single because. You won't have neediness projected at a potential mate. You won't have any of those things. Now, what, what, what a lot of the women spirits want to do, who are, uh, who are following us around a lot lately, um, is they want to detune every woman from ever, ever attracting their male counterpart. Right. And and like, can I just encourage you all to get really real? Like for me, this is one of the reasons that I was really wanted us to talk about what is the non-injured state of sexuality and soulmate joining. Because for me, when I met AJ, I really did not, in my heart of hearts, sexuality was like, it was never going to be a joy to me. It was never going to be a joyful part of who I am. I really felt like... Yeah, sex is something that I got occasional pleasure from, but it was not it was not a, a beloved part of the expression of who I am, um, and that's what it that's what how God intends it to be for all of us. And and I feel a lot of us feel quite what well, I certainly did, and I do feel a lot of women feel in their heart of hearts quite despondent about sexuality, about the concept of joining. It feels fraught with fear and shame. And the potential of being controlled and harmed 
And um, the reality is, as we work through this stuff, the danger of those things happening decreases monumentally. The danger of us being harmed or getting into a situation that makes us feel shameful actually decreases quite a lot. Um, but going into this stuff, if we really feel what's inside of us, inside of our bodies about sex, how we feel about our sexual organs, there's a lot of heaviness that can shut us down from the possibilities. Um, yeah, yeah. I did a channeling actually specifically about this topic yesterday mm. uh, from my guides and they were encouraging me to um, remember that every one of God's creations in its, its natural state is to heal <laughs> and to have joy. Uh, it's, it's not only instinct but inevitability when we open ourselves to our emotions and to love. And so I just maybe want to inspire you a little bit to get real because it really took me getting very real about what I felt about sex the rage, the shame, the fear, and I'm still in that process, but it's very rewarding and it doesn't feel like my sexuality is this dirty old rag that I'd like to hide from myself and everyone else um, for the rest of my life, you know. It's something that, that can grow and blossom and be beautiful, so, mm. yeah. Yeah, yeah um, <laughs> yes, uh, Mike coming, yep. yeah. Oh, hang on a sec. It is. Yep. Yep. Ooh. Yep. Yeah. Um, uh, some people are feeling drowsy. I'm feeling the opposite, and yep. I've been sitting on the edge of my chair. Can you <laughs> tell me why? <laughs> that's good. That's good. We well, feel excited, obviously. Yeah. 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 And, and that's good. that's a really good thing. I awesome. feel very awake. I mean, the last one when you did the channeling uh, the other day, I was knocked out. Yeah. Yeah. But now I'm feeling very. Whenever awake. we feel shut down, that's the time to look and go. Well, yeah, obviously we're not. I've we're got some fear or some, some block to this topic. Yeah. You obviously do not have much fear associated with this topic. And mm -hmm. for that reason, the women spirits around who want to shut you down cannot shut you down on this particular topic. And that's wonderful. Uh, for many of the uh, women in the audience, it's the opposite to that. Mm -hmm. They have a lot of fear and shame associated with the topic. And so therefore, you know, there's a lot of heavy women spirits who, can, who are in the same condition can easily shut them down as a result. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's good. It's lovely that you feel yeah. excited. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's good. <laughs> um, Nina, if we come across there. I am myself one of these women that don't want a soulmate. Yeah. And um, before being on the path, I've been with a lot of different men. And since I joined the path, I just shut down. Yeah. And um, even self, sex, like everything. Yeah. And I feel how it's really hard. I feel today a lot of pain everywhere here, and I even wrote my questions because I, I cannot connect to them. But um, for me, there is a guy in front that I, it, it really triggered me a lot, and I've got a lot of anger yeah. towards him. Yeah. But at the same time, it's like my mind saying I don't want to be with him, and at the same time, sometimes I'm next to him and I cannot move. I just want to stay, and my mind saying No, go away. So, do you feel you know who your soulmate is? Is that what you're saying? I don't know. I had when I had the thought it could be, yeah. it totally repulsed me, yeah. and I just like Oh, and when they ask me, they say, Have you ever thought we could be soulmate? And I say, Oh, no way. So I push him away. Yeah. But um, at the same time, sometimes when I'm next to him, I don't know, I, I just feel paralyzed. And I don't want to stay, but my mind's saying, you need to go away. I, it's really strange. I don't really know how to explain it. Yeah, Mary can understand many of those emotions. <laughs> <you know. laughs> yep. And um, so I was feeling more and more things. I try to open to this. I want to spend time with him and see what's happened. And someone say to me, well, because he doesn't really match my demands and expectations, he's not really the guy I'd like my soulmate to be. And at the same time, I really like him as a person, but yeah. not as my soulmate. Yeah. And um, last week, someone said to me, but maybe you think he's your soulmate, you have this feeling because he's very sensitive and he's very shy and he's very, like, but... At the same time, I'm very emotional with him. And, um, but me, this, 
what Gabriela said, I was thinking maybe she's right. Maybe I actually, uh, not in my mind, but in my soul, attracting to him because he's very sensitive. And then we have this false belief that our soulmate could be sensitive. That what the, the girl said. And I was feeling maybe it's a false belief again. And I don't, I'm really <laughs> confused. And I was. So, how would you resolve that question, Nina? See, can you see you're getting very intellectual about, yeah. uh, and very confused yeah. about um, something that you could easily investigate without having to have sex with the man? You, you, could yeah. get, you could easily investigate all of these issues if you chose to be open and just let yourself feel your feelings on the issue. You see, qu quite often what we do is we do the opposite to that, you know. We start, we, we want all of our, what in Australia the saying is our T's crossed and our I's dotted. I don't know what the saying is in, in, in Europe. Mm -hmm. But basically we want everything to be perfect before we engage something. But the problem is that our, our idea of perfection is not God's creation of perfection for us. It's, a, it's just our idea from our childhood that is the idea of perfection. And so, yes, you may feel that you love to have a sensitive man, but let's look at the men you have chosen up to this point in terms of your relationships. Have many of them been sensitive men? Well, sensitive, but really not like him. Like okay. really different. Li okay. Different. I don't know how to explain it. But okay, and 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 this particular man, you don't actually feel a sexual attraction to him at this point. No. You just want to be friends, but yeah. you can't contemplate not being friends, which is interesting in itself. Yeah, and yeah, and especially when when I feel the remorse about how I'm angry with him. My, my grief is bigger than other men. That's what I'm feeling. Why is that? I feel a lot of grief around being angry with him. Yep. So, so this is the things to look at and be sensitive about. The fact is, something very strange is going on around here. Something strange going on <laughs> around here. And, uh, and the strange thing is that this is very different than your normal attractions and normal type of relationships that you've had in the past with men, is it not? Yeah. So, so it's worth investigation just from that perspective, isn't it? Okay. Right? And, and why do you have this unreasoning anger with him? Because oh, that's yeah. what it feels like, isn't it? Yeah. It's, like it's an anger you can't sort of explain. It's like rage, a yeah. big rage. Yeah. Okay. So, so why is there this l very large rage with this guy that you, st but you still feel like you have to be friends with? <laughs> so there is a lot of contrary emotions and... And as we go through this discussion, you'll see that actually soulmate attractions, which, which eventually result in sexual attraction between just you and one other person, are very much like this at times, where there are a lot of contrary emotions that are going on between the two halves. Because, because we're going to feel the injury of our partner, and our partner is going to feel our injuries, our soul partner uh, is going to feel our injuries more intensely than any other person. And we're going to feel their injuries more intensely than any other person. And, and unless we're both focused on dealing with those particular injuries, we are not going to join unless we have a deep desire to be humble, a mm. deep desire to really feel every emotion that we feel. Mm. And can I, can I make a suggestion, Nina? Yes, At please. the moment, you would like to know. <laughs> yeah. Before you investigate, you would like to know, one way or the other. And the truth is on this path, as we get to know God, as we get to know ourselves, there's many unknowns. And we have to get used to that. We have to get used to the fact that I'm not going to know everything before I step into the whatever it is I'm stepping into. But I would, I would keep in mind two questions. How can I explore this possibility lovingly? And how can I purify my soulmate desire? Because a pure soulmate desire, like we talked about before, we're going to know out of the hundred guys in front of us, we're going to go, that's the guy and I know it. Because there's a purity in my desire. It's not based on my injuries helping me avoid my injury. Can I point out something? One thing I loved about Mary's attitude when she met me was um, I, I did not tell her that she was my soulmate, actually. I want to correct what, what might have been a suggestion earlier. Um, friends of mine told Mary that I felt she, Mary was my soulmate. Now, now, Mary, when she heard that, she got told it actually by her 
parents. So my they friends were, yeah. told her parents, and her parents told Mary. Now, um, when Mary was told that, she had a lot of tumultuous type of feelings come up, similar to the kind of feelings you're feeling, confusion, thing, feelings she didn't understand. Not uh, at all. I've met him twice, hardly spoken. The second time I got very unreasonably rageful, couldn't understand why. Um, and then I, he left, I had other things on my mind, on my life, and I was told, and immediately I couldn't sleep or eat for two weeks. Now, one thing I liked about what Mary did was she was open enough to in explore or investigate in a loving manner, although perhaps at times it wasn't that loving, but <laughs> to, in to explore or investigate the potential, uh, potential of this particular thing. And the reason why she was open is she felt like she had to. She felt inside of herself a feeling that I've got to investigate this. For some reason, I feel like I've got to investigate. So I trusted that. So she trusted her knowing. own yeah. feeling, her own feeling of wanting to investigate. She trusted herself enough to know that she, would, she could leave me any time she wanted. She could, she could decide to do whatever she wanted. She trusted at least that enough. And there are many times during her investigation that she did leave me mm. as a result of that. And I think that is fantastic because she trusted herself enough to do that. Does that make sense? You see, oftentimes what we want is we want... The reason why we want everything to know up front is because we don't trust ourselves enough to be able to make the right decision at the right time. And what I liked about what Mary did was that she trusted herself enough to know, well, if I, go, if I feel like I want to leave him, I'll leave him. If I feel like I want to go back to him, I'll give him a call. <laughs> you know, she trusted herself enough through that process. And this is what we need to be prepared to do if we wish to investigate these issues with regard to relationship and yeah. regard to attractions. We need to trust ourselves enough to know that we can enter or exit at any time. And and this, this is why I stress the lovingly. Like you... Um, because you shouldn't emulate my behaviour apart from that one <laughs> aspect because I did it quite angrily at times. And the beauty is that now for a couple of years you know what you've been experiencing your emotions, you know what it means to own your anger, all of those things. So you can actually, you know the principles of love so you can explore lovingly. But when I met AJ I had no idea about love. So I was exploring but I wasn't always very loving. But I, I sort of even feel though, even that was the case, I'm very glad that Mary had enough um, courage in her own soul and enough presence of her own mind to actually explore something, even though it at times may not have been lovingly in the way she did it. I'm very glad she, she took that choice and actually did it. Because without the engagement, you can never resolve even the unlovingness. Do you know what I mean? Without the engagement, it's very difficult to actually resolve. And so this is where I feel that it's very important to, um, even if at times you become unloving in the exploration, it's important to go, oh, and this Mary did this many times. And uh, like I feel Mary is a good example in terms of being humble about it, in the sense that Mary many times felt in a rage with me recognised she was in a rage with me, went away for a while and worked through some of the issues of why she was so angry and dealt with that without condemning her own feelings about the whole process. And I feel that's what many people need to do. Like They need to investigate these things without condemnation of their own feelings of the process. Now, many others condemn your feelings, but the key is to forget about that and focus, and this is what I liked about what Mary did, is she had enough presence of her own character and mind and courage to investigate the process, knowing that she could do whatever she wanted to in this process and work her way through the particular issues involved. And I feel, even, even I feel, explore without the lovingly is better than actually shutting down the whole exploration process at all. To me, that is just a complete avoidance and denial of what's present when you do that. Mm -hmm. So you're far better to, while exploring lovingly is great, it just, just the process of exploring is also, I feel, quite powerful. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. you.
And of course, to purify your soulmate desire, you're going to need to be humble. You're going to need to look at, well, what are my expectations? What, are, what addictions do I want a man to help? Like, what emotions do I want a man to help me avoid? And the more you look at that, the more your, your pure desire will emerge. So ask yourself some basic questions now. What do I find sexy in a man? Write down a list of all the things you find sexy in a man. Write down all the things that you want in your ideal partner. Because many of these things are based on emotional injuries that we've picked up through our life, in particular in our relationship with either one or both parents. In other words, we either absorb what our mother thinks is ideal, if we're connected to our mother, or we absorb, you know, we see the ideal in our father, and therefore that's the kind of man we feel is the kind of man we want. Minus the negative attributes, generally that's what we go for. So, so for example, if our father was tall, a bit la on the large side, um, he, he, had a, he has uh, emotions of arrogance towards other men, he has emotions of belittling other women, um, then we're going to be very attracted to that kind of a man unless we heal those emotions. In other words, we're going to be attracted to a younger version who's arrogant, who's, uh, who's got anger towards other men and who belittles women. That, that's the man we're going to feel sexually attracted to as a result of those, those things. So the key thing is to make the list, you know, allow yourself to see the truth of what you find currently sexy and attractive. What do you find is the ideal? What's your ideal? You know, look at pictures of what you feel is ideal even, you know. Look at the picture and then ask yourself, why am I feeling that particular person is ideal? What does that do inside of me that causes me to feel attracted to that? Why is that particularly attractive to me? And um, the problem with almost all of our attractions here on the planet is that we have idealised so much of our attractions, but not only that, we have, we have done this other thing, and that is we are all seeking perfection. And to be frank, none of our soulmates are perfect. Mm. So if we're all seeking perfection and none of our soulmates are perfect, are we ever going to really know who our soulmate is while we're doing this? We need to get underneath those feelings of what's perfect and into the real reason why we believe that particular thing is perfect. So why do you believe a six foot three man who's nice and slender and, and you know, got a muscly body and everything, why do you believe he's perfect? There's got to be a reason. Does that make sense? Uh, of that. Because the reality is you, a five foot ten man or a five foot three man who's got an entirely different body may be your soulmate. Yes. <laughs> Can I ask another question about um, in the soulmate relationship when you share truth, like when you explained before about desires, love, and truth? Uh, I don't know. Um, for me, when I shared, we've been very truthful from the beginning, yep. and it's beautiful and triggering. And it's like, so I don't know how it works in the relationship about the truth thing. You're saying a lot of contrary things, aren't you? It's beautiful but triggering. It's, I like it when because When you say I triggering, you mean that it causes you to feel emotional and get angry and upset. Is that what you're saying? Well, I like it because I can really say things or he would say things. But then when he says something, I don't like to hear it. <laughs> okay, so you don't want to hear it. You're shut down. You're rejecting what he's saying and so forth. Yep. Um, yeah, my, my suggestion is, again, the same issue. Yeah. So if you were yeah. humble to all that process, you wouldn't go into a shutdown place. You wouldn't go into rejection. Nina, when AJ and I first met, um, for some of the time we were we were split up. Sometimes geographically, and sometimes because we don't, I, I didn't want to be in a relationship with him. And but he would send me these emails, long emails. You know, AJ can talk a lot. He can type a lot too. <laughs> and um, and he would send me these big long emails and I'd sit down and I'd read it and I'd read it and I'd read it and I'd read it and I'd, read it and I'd go, ah! And I couldn't respond, I was so angry. And then I'd go, I couldn't, but I couldn't leave it because I knew he was saying the truth. And even if it was just the truth of what he felt. It's a lot more bluntly that Mary felt that though. Yeah. <laughs> Effort, he's right. Yes. <laughs> is the, is the Damn reason. it, he's <laughs> saying, well, I can't let it go, it's the truth. You know, and um, it was very compelling, the truth 
so it confronted a lot of my injury. Mind you, and I my didn't do that without Mary first inviting me to. So, Absolutely. So he didn't, se- it was I didn't always send in her response. unsolicited emails. No. I always sent her an email in response to her desire. Yeah, yeah. So I wanted to hear from him and then I'd hear from him and then I'd hate it and then I'd like have and to Then respond, she'd send me an angry yeah. response. Yeah. Like, <laughs> and then I'd respond to her angry response, you know, you know explaining the emotions involved, which made her even more angry. And then she, I wouldn't hear from her for a while again, you know. Like, yeah. <laughs> And the more hum- humility we have in terms of listening, uh, the smoother the engagement becomes. Right? It's only tumultuous because we're not one or both parties are not being humble. Right? So, so this is the thing we need to re- realise is that if, if any engagement with any person is tumultuous, it's be- usually because one or both of you are not being humble. And this particularly applies to anything regarding investigating or exploring the soulmate relationship. If it's tumultuous and causes lots of things to come up, then one or both of you are not being humble enough to feel your own stuff. Yeah. And, and Nina, I often make this joke with AJ that, um, that we're having our relationship in reverse. Like some people are married for 30 years and their sex life is in ruins. They're hardly connected to each other. They don't talk. They, you know, they don't, it's all lukewarm and everything. <laughs> uh, but when they first met, it was like daisy, honeymoon, fantastic. Well, uh, sometimes I feel like <laughs> we're with like the flip side. The, the more we go on, the more romantic and beautiful it becomes. But when we started out, it was like, well, I had a lot of gripes from the past, you know, and I wanted to, and there was a lot of, lack of connection our sex life and I was life frightened of it really I was just yeah. frightened of Mary really yeah. yeah there was just so much like I was a bit frightened of me too because I didn't understand <laughs> the emotions because Mary had never acted that way towards mm. other men you yeah. see so she was a bit confused about why she felt all these things uh, with myself yeah. and 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 but I was frightened because uh, a lot of it was just because I could feel the anger and rage and and, and I could understand it but I couldn't we, Mary wasn't at the time sometimes even open enough to, to talk about why she felt the way she felt, you know. And so um, I, I didn't know how to handle a lot of it. Like I was quite frightened and sometimes it was a relief that she ran away for a while so I could, <laughs> <laughs> so, so I could have a breather, you know. Like that's how it felt. And I don't know if all soulmate relationships start that way though. But ours obviously had a lot of <laughs> pretext in you the know. first century, ours was similar, actually, yeah. when we first met. You know, when we first met, we both felt, uh, like I felt, uh, that I knew who she was. Mary didn't have a concept of soulmates at the time, but, but she felt quite a strong attraction to me. But within a very short period of time, she was bitterly angry with me as mm. well. So, you know, in a lot of ways, our... I've been angry about that too, Nina. I'm yeah. always the bad guy. <laughs> so she was even angry about being angry with me. <laughs> she was angry that, like, I'm never angry with her and she's always angry with me. What's going on? <laughs> that kind of thing. And so, yeah, you know, you, the key is be willing to explore at least. Be willing to explore. But also, if you can be as humble as possible to what you're actually I'd, feeling. Like, I just think it's awesome to understand as much as you do about God, soulmates and emotion and then to find your soulmate like I wish I knew I, that I'd reconnected to any of it you know because it would have been a lot smoother yeah yeah yeah, yeah. do you think it's better to tell him or just explore just myself and Ex- not say well, you don't anything. know for certain do you no so don't say anything you don't no. know for certain okay. but you can say to him look I you know you might be right okay. Okay. isn't he said to you perhaps we're soulmates or well he never said he asked me one day he said have you ever thought, he never said, but he, like, he, he didn't want to say, I feel we soulmate. So yeah. he just said, have you ever thought we could be soulmate? And I was like, because yeah. I had a thought before and I was like, no, no, no. Yeah. And I said, oh, no, never. And no, I no. lied because I had the same thought. And I was okay. Like, oh. <laughs> so stop lying and start telling the <laughs> truth. So, oh, well, yes, now that you mention it, yeah. I don't want it to be true, but <laughs> this is how I feel, you know. Okay. Start, uh, you remember truth, desire and love are the three things that are going to help it grow if it's going to grow. And it's going to sort out very rapidly whether you're soulmates or not, actually, if you stay in truth, desire and love. So, so you're not going to open to your soulmate by lying by misrepresenting the truth <laughs> to them, right? So if you're not attracted to some p- part of him or her, then tell, tell them. 
And, and, but also work through, in humility, why you feel but, that yeah, way. Yeah, and remember the love for it hangs. Yeah. So you don't have to force it upon them. You just be yourself. So if they say, do you like my body? You say, no. <laughs> and, you know, they'll have heard about that to feel and you'll have to work out why you don't, you know. And it could be partly because their body isn't being looked after by them and that's why you don't like it. Or it might be that you just don't like that body type because you've yet to release the emotion about your dad. You want your dad's body type and not his. You know, that kind of thing. So, you see, if both are humble, then each will feel their own emotion about those particular things. Yeah? Thank you so much. <laughs> cool. well, we have a well, let's have a break, shall we? Yeah. We have a break. And uh, maybe half an hour or so, and we'll get back on the subject.